Good evening, and welcome to this February 1st meeting of the Bloomington Planning Commission. The Planning Commission advises the City Council on development proposals, development standards, long-range planning, and transportation issues. Each Planning Commissioner has been appointed by the City Council to serve a three-year term for a maximum of two terms. On some items, the Planning Commission has final decision-making authority, while other items, the City Council will make the final decision. As we begin this evening, we're going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. All rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have five items on our agenda this evening. We have two public hearings and three study items. Um, the first two items are public hearings. On public hearings, the uh, public is encouraged to testify. You can do that here at City Hall, and we'll talk more about that when, it, uh, when we open a public hearing on item number one. Uh, you can also testify remotely if you're at home watching this live this evening. Those instructions will be on the bottom of your screen, scrolling as we go through the public hearings. With that, we'll begin with item number one, which is a preliminary and final development plan for an apartment building um, uh, just off of 494. I'm sorry I don't have the address, but Ms. O'Day, I'm sure you can help me with that as we get started. Thank you, Chair and Commission. Item one on your agenda this evening is for a preliminary and final development plan for a five-story, 208-unit um, apartment building and a detached 11,000-square-foot daycare and a conditional use permit uh, for said daycare at 6701 West 78th Street. To orient you to the site, this is uh, just north of 494 between East and Bush Lake Road. Uh, surrounding land uses are single family, uh, city, v city of Edina jurisdiction to the north, offices to the east and west, and then 494 to the south. Um, just a note about zoning, it is zone C4 and uh, guided office. The base zoning and the guide plan are not, um, will remain unchanged. And then just a uh, view of the current condition on the site from a street view perspective. As you can see, it's a vacant lot with um, lots of vegetation. A little bit of history on the site. On the right is a 2003 aerial. Um, it was a health club, and then in 2006, it was demolished. And then several years later, City Council approved a development proposal for a four-story, 186-unit residential care and senior living facility with a 100-person daycare. Those uh, approvals have expired, and development never took place. And then more recently, um, City Council approved a privately initiated city code amendment to change daycares from limited to conditional uses in the C4 zoning district, which ultimately allowed for the applicant to move forward with their current proposal. A little bit about the site plan. Overall, they're providing 208 units. Uh, 19 of those would be um, at 60% area median income, which is the minimum for the OHO. And then the remaining 189 units would be uh, market rate. And then just a couple things to highlight on the site plan. Currently, there are three uh, curb cuts onto 78th Street. Um, they're proposing to have the easternmost access be a right in, right out only. And then the western would be a full access, which would require some median modifications. And then the southwest corner of the site is undevelopable. It's the um, Nine Mile Creek wetland area. And then just to show the underground uh, garage entrances toward the back of the site. And then, of course, the 11,000 square foot daycare would be located on the western half of the site. And then just note um, outdoor amenities. They're showing an outdoor pool and plaza area. So in the C4 zoning district, um, they're required to have a 0.2 floor area ratio, which amounts to 61,000 square feet of non-residential area. And so if we eliminate the undevelopable land in the uh, southwest corner of the site, what remains is 42, almost uh, 42 and a half thousand square feet. Um, and so what they're proposing is the 11,000 square foot daycare, which amounts to 0 0.03 floor area ratio, and that's considerably less than what's required. So they're um, requesting development flexibility. 
due to reasons such as a large portion of the site is undevelopable um, and it's financially infeasible to provide 61,000 square feet of non-residential area. And then from a staff's perspective, um, economic and environmental uh, perspectives and providing daycare, which fills a kind of gap in the market. Um, this is a, a overall benefit seeing development because um, it's been vacant for 17 years. And then here's a couple of elevations. They're showing uh, balconies for select units, and then they're showing for materials, glass, brick, concrete, metal siding, and fiber cement board. And they are taking advantage of the OHO for the fiber cement board, which allows for more secondary materials located on the non-street facing side. So overall, the building materials are compliant. And then daycare elevation, um, this does not qualify for the OHO incentive, so they have to meet the 15% uh, secondary, 85% primary materials, and they are code compliant. So they're showing brick, metal siding, and fiber cement board. And then here's going back to the residential building. Uh, here's the first floor plan. Um, as you can see, there's a studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom um, units on all, all five floors. And then on the first floor, they're showing amenities such as game room, uh, yoga, fitness area, and then of course the um, uh, pool and outdoor plaza area. And then there's a rooftop deck on the, on the top level. A little bit about the daycare. Um, that code amendment made daycares a conditional use um, in the C4 zoning district, so they are applying for the conditional use permit tonight. Um, the applicant has not identified a daycare provider at this time, um, so they have provided some comparable daycare information uh, for this application. So they're showing 150 children with 30 caregivers, and just a note that if if that increases, they will have to come back for an amendment to their conditional use permit. Um, and they're also showing a 5,000 square foot uh, playground toward the back. So here's a, a standard floor plan, um, pretty standard and typical of, of daycares. So they're showing a multi-purpose uh, room, classrooms of course, office space, and then the outdoor play area. Um, back to the residential um, building, their landscaping um, uh, is code compliant in terms of quantity of trees and shrubs. A couple minor tweaks are needed, um, which can be handled at building permit level. Um, they have to fill in some gaps of, of screening um, located toward uh, West 78th Street that has to be a solid screen. And then parking lot islands do require trees, and so they're showing three islands without trees, so those have to be provided. As far as parking goes, um, 381 stalls are required for the development when applying the OHO 10% parking reduction. Uh, they're showing 358 stalls on site, 210 of which are in a one level underground garage and then 148 uh, on the surface. And so they are requesting development flexibility for the parking uh, and due to varying times between the daycare and the residential use, um, the 148 surface stalls would be shared. And then just a couple miscellaneous items um, for further review. Uh, the public sidewalk width has to be widened to eight feet. They're showing six feet currently, so it has to be widened two feet. Um, as well as photometric plans have to be submitted for the building permit and then um, interior trash collection is required for the um, daycare. So just a couple notes on that. And then I just wanted to show um, the renderings of the site just to kind of give you a flavor of what, um, what it would look like. And with that, staff is recommending approval and the applicant is online and um, I'm here for any questions. Thank you, Ms. O'Day. Any questions for staff from the Planning Commission? Uh, Commissioner Goldsman. Thank you, Chair. I see in the plan for the daycare that there is a kitchen. Does staff know um, if there's food planning to be prepared on site or is it going to be catered? Um, Chair, Commissioner Goldsman, um, I think because a daycare provider has not been identified, that's maybe a little bit unknown at this point. Um, but if the applicant knows kind of what the food preparation looks like, I ask them to to speak to that. Okay, I'll wait till 
we have that opportunity. Thank you. Other questions for staff? Seeing none, we will now hear from the applicant, who I believe is online. Um, if you, uh, uh, Ms. O'Day, the name of the applicants, do you know? Uh, it's, yep, Brian Bachman and Griffin Jamison. Great, Mr. Bachman and Mr. Jamison. Uh, I believe we will unmute, unmute you now and give you a chance to speak. Or you can unmute yourself, I believe. Uh, Mr. Bachman or Mr. Jameson, we can't hear you yet. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Perfect. Thank you. Um, my name is Brian Bachman. I'm with the Enclave Companies. Um, to answer the one direct question, no, we, do, we, we don't have, uh, we're working with several different um, daycare providers right now to kind of figure out who's going to fit best on the site. So we don't really know how um, food service will be handled on that yet. Uh, beyond that, I think Liz did a great job of uh, outlining anything and don't have a whole lot more to add and just here to answer any questions and um, be able to clear up anything that comes up. Very well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Jamison, if you'd like to speak, I'll give you a, a minute to, to do so if you choose. Uh, good evening, uh, Planning Commission members. Uh, my name is Griffin Jamison with Cos Wilson Architects. Um, I'm here just to say hello um, and answer any questions that may come up as well. And um, that's really all I have uh, for the time being. Thank you. Very well. Questions now from the Planning Commission for the applicant. Commissioner Curry. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> is, it sounds like you guys are anticipating to potentially sell off the daycare after that's developed and uh, subdivide the site. Do you have any idea where you would plan to subdivide the site is along uh, the shared parking at all, or can you give us any idea on that? We really haven't. Um, we're working with uh, uh, one group that wants us to do a build the suit, another that would want to do the other, um, the, and then uh, another one that's kind of says either or. Um, the answer would be is I think right now, um, and Griffin can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I'm pretty sure what we had always planned was the, um, the lot would basically run right along the edge of the parking field that's running um, on the side of that building. They would have those dedicated spots in the front, and then we would work out a shared parking agreement um, for staff and other parking that they need along the uh, the side of the building. Um, since the, obvi the obvious times for the daycare um, uses work well with when a great many of our um, tenants are going to be um, working, uh, we feel real comfortable that we can handle the, the parking, the shared parking with it, with both properties. Commissioner Curry. Thank you. Uh, just a quick follow up then. Um, I don't know if you guys have done it. Obviously the FAR is much lower than what the city has, uh, per the zoning code, but, um, have you done any sort of, you know, just basic math as to what the FAR would be on that subdivision after yeah, after you guys subdivide the property, does it become more in line with code? Uh, I haven't done that. I'm not sure if staff has. Okay. Um, thank you. Any other commis uh, questions, Commissioner Curry? Uh, no, I'm good. Okay. Commissioner Goldsman. Thank you. Um, one thing that I read in the packet was a concern around snow removal. Um, can either staff or the applicant talk about what the plans are for snow removal, if it ever snows again, um, <laughs> uh, on the property and the site? I can take that. Um, we obviously are going to have some spaces on the site that we can that we can stack snow, but this would be an export site. If we had a a winter that looked anything like last winter as opposed to this winter, um, we truck it out when we don't, when we cease to have room. All right, thank you. So I'm kind of liking this year much better than last year. <laughs> uh, Mr. Bachman, I have a question. Uh, so the south face of your, uh, particularly the apartment building faces 494. Um, a lot of the buildings on 494 have a, a very sort of dynamic street presence to announce themselves to 
that corridor. Uh, it doesn't appear that your your building's going to have that. Was there any consideration on your end to have any type of a dynamic or uh, call it what you want, lighting, et cetera, on the south face of your building? There is some there is some unique lighting prospect uh, projected to be on the on the corners of the building that are going to be on those insets. Um, nope, that's actually something that's been discussed and is already being planned. Um, with the with the volume of traffic on that travels that travels past on 494, it's an obvious area where we need to be able to um, identify the building. So no, there the um, the exterior and and the rest that'll continue to be hammered out as we finalize our um, construction drawings. Great, thank you. Any other questions for the applicant, Commissioner Albrecht? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, my question is back to the um, Opportunity Housing Ordinance and the parking requirement. There is a 23 stall difference. Have you um, thrown around what it would look like to incorporate an additional 23 stalls? And um, what are the barriers there? Um, to do so, we'd have to lose units, which makes the, prop the project and the property not feasible. Um, even with the daycare sp spaces, we're at about a 1.6 to 1 ratio on site, which is well within our um, typical unit mix. Our, our projects usually are between 1.6 and 1.8 per unit. Our other project that we're just finishing up over um, on 35W and uh, uh, called Noble um, is actually at a 1.5 to 1. Um, so that one's even a little bit lower than this one. So no, this is, um, parking is not really a concern for us. It's actually, an, it, and that's a, the wrong way for me to say it. Parking is a huge concern from us. Um, it's something that we kind of fixate on early and often during our design process from this very simple fact that under park sites don't have repeat customers. We could build the coolest apartment in the world with all the finest amenities that you could ever possibly get. And if people don't have a place to park when they come home at night, um, they're they're not going to renew, right? They're going to leave. So it is always something that we study. It's always something that we manage very closely um, with our management team. We are a um, we are the developer, the contractor, the manager, and the long term owner of all of our projects. We never we don't sell our projects. So we don't when we design things, we're designing them um, to own them thirty years from now. So we always. Um, take parking as a very strong consideration as to how we can do with site. We actually had um, a couple of different versions of this that had a few extra units and even a little less parking. And this is kind of where we settled. We actually added onto the building footprint, um, the parking footprint, the underground part so that we can pick up even more parking spots. Um, they're very, very expensive parking spots, but we still just wanted to make sure that we could get everybody covered. So, um, we're pretty comfortable with where we are on it because we're at a 1.71 with uh, with the shared parking with with the daycare center. So we're we're pretty much in our sweet spot with it. Commissioner Curry, thanks, Chair. Um, again, in terms of parking, um, is there? I guess do you have any plans to have guest parking specifically defined, or is all parking open to residents and guests? All of the underground parking is assigned, and then all of this, all of the um, parking in the surface parking is not assigned. That is just open, open parking. We do require um, uh, cabs if you're going to be parking there overnight longer than just like a guest. Um, you'll have a, par a parking pass that you'll hang on your on your windshield so that we we know that the people um, that are on site are who you know who the which vehicles belong to which units. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? Seeing none, Mr. Bachman, Mr. Jameson, thank you. Thank you. I will open the public hearing now. And uh, again, folks here at uh, the council chambers are encouraged to testify if they so choose. Uh, the way this will work is we'll give each speaker about three minutes to speak. That makes sure we give everybody a chance. There's a sign-in sheet on the dais. We'll ask you to make sure you speak into the microphone. Uh, so the folks on TV can hear you. And um, uh, a note of, 
of clarification, uh, the way this generally works is it's it's a public comment period and not as much of a public question and answer period. That keeps things moving and gives everybody a chance to speak. You are welcome to ask us questions. You can direct those to me, the chair. The Planning Commission will make note of those questions and we'll decide how we want to address those uh, once the public hearing is closed. With that, if anyone would like to testify on this item, please come forward and sign in. Hello, I'm already signed in. Thank you. If we could have your name, please. Woodrow Piner. Thank you. Uh, thanks for allowing me to, to speak here tonight. My name is Woodrow Piner. I'm a business representative with the North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters. Uh, the NCSRCC represents over 27,000 men and women carpenters in our six state council, which includes Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, Nebraska, North and South Dakota. Um, I've been on staff for nine years with my primary focus being the director of the Twin Cities Wage Theft and Exploitation Team. In that role, myself and others track projects where subcontractors and general contra contractors use below board numbers obtained by practices that involve cash payments to workers on paid overtime, misclassification and workers compensation fraud. The previously mentioned practices are typically targeting a immigrant workforce and in some cases have went as far as trafficking workers and narcotics. The NCSRCC has been working with law enforcement, state and city elected officials and other trades to shine a bright light on these exploitive practices that prey on workers and tax dollars. Despite these efforts over the last seven years, there continues to be a group of developers and general contractors that look the other way to gain an uncompetitive advantage on price and profit at the expense of workers' dignity and our tax dollars. I'm here tonight speaking on the Enclave proposal at 6701 West 78th Street. Enclave is a developer GC combo originally based out of North Dakota that entered the Twin Cities market in the tail end of 2019. Red flags were raised immediately upon their arrival in regards to a out-of-state wood frame subcontractor Icon Construction who had several federal OSHA and labor violations. Enclave had hired them on their first three projects. The NCC, NCSRCC tried reaching out to Enclave to discuss the issues but received nothing but radio silence. It was not until a proposal in Brooklyn Park with Enclave where they were requesting a $2.4 million tax increment financing for a 146 unit building that Enclave would have to respond publicly to some of these practices being reported by workers on their projects. After testimony was given in regards to red flags of exploited practices on Enclave projects, the city of Brooklyn Park decided not to award the TIF. It was not until then that Enclave reached out to the NCS NCSRCC to, to discuss some of the problems articulated in the testimonies. It appeared that progress had been made. The project in Brooklyn Park moved on but had shrunk in size without the $2.4 million in TIF. Enclave moved on to another subcontractor that although different in name, utilized the same business model. Wolf Construction Incorporated was awarded the framing package and despite warnings, Enclave moved on with them. Subsequently, the labor, the labor broker, Nelson Lopez, who had provided Wolf with the labor force on that project was charged and pled guilty to workers' comp premium fraud last year. The Star Tribune ran a story on the case and actually mentioned that Brooklyn Park project in the story. Enclave made some attempts to clean up the subcontractors they hired by hiring a wood frame company that pays area standards and wages and benefits for their initial Bloomington project. Since then, things have turned in a different direction on ongoing projects around the Twin Cities. Mindac Commercial Construction Services LLC, Innovative Services and Absolute Drywall Incorporated have been hired on recent and ongoing projects. Workers from all three of these companies have reported being paid cash, not being paid overtime, and not being covered by a workers, workers' comp policy that would compensate them if injury occurred. In fact, Absolute Drywall Incorporated has one federal and two state findings depicting child labor, unpaid overtime, and misclassification. Mr. Piner, we've got you at three minutes. Here tonight, time. hoping that this testimony helps provide a pathway for this proposal to provide good middle-class jobs and not a race to the bottom for workers in Bloomington and the Twin Cities. Thank you for the opportunity. You're welcome. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? Seeing no one stepping forward, do we have anyone online, Mr. Uh, Mark Gerb? Chair Cookton, everyone online is the applicant or city staff. Very well. I'll look for a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Motion to close the public hearing. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We will now move to Planning Commission discussion. Uh, 
Um, I actually have a question for staff I'd like to uh, clarify. Ms. O'Day, so in the staff report, I noticed the notification of public uh, notification uh, that we included Edina. Is that a new thing? I thought we didn't uh, notify sister cities. Has that changed? Uh, Chair, we did notify Edina staff, and I, I don't know what we've done in the past. Maybe Mr. Mark Regard can know. Yeah, it's uh, Chair Cookton. We did notify everybody within 500 feet, uh, including Edina residents. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. And Ms. O'Day, I apologize for not um, emailing you earlier about this, but there was one condition I was hoping I could ask you about, uh, which is condition number 29 which I'll just read here. Compliance with Minnesota Rules Chapter 7030, noise pollution control is required. There was a note in the staff report that um, noise may be a concern with the proximity to 494. Uh, when we've had noise um, applications before, so it was always my understanding that um, an applicant's surrounding uses are not something, sorry, they're, the noise that surrounds them is not something they're responsible for, that they're really kind of responsible for themselves. Could you maybe just talk a little bit more about that? Hmm. Um, Chair, yeah, so there is a condition that um, the noise has to be um, compliant with the Minnesota statute. Um, I'm kind of struggling to answer your question. Maybe. Perhaps maybe I'll ask, is that boilerplate language um, or is that something unique to this site? Oh, that's boilerplate language. Okay. Yep. Not that we didn't think about it. <laughs> okay. All right, now we will move into uh, additional planning commission discussion. Commissioner Curry. Uh, I guess just in light of the public testimony, my first question, I guess, for the city is, do we, are any any of the topics that were brought up, is that within our purview to think about or discuss? What do we, is that something we should be thinking about? Perhaps that's a question for Mr. Toski. Yeah, you have um, a conditional use permit application preliminary and final development plan so those are um what are called quasi-judicial type of applications so you apply the facts as they've been laid out to what the standards are in the ordinance and that's all you're to consider so if they meet all those standards in the ordinance then you could approve the the application but things that are extraneous to that um no you wouldn't be able to consider those as part of your recommendation thank you assistant uh city attorney kevin toski Further discussion? Commissioner Goldsman. Thank you, Chair. Um, just talking about the application in front of us here, um, as the city of Bloomington is lo always looking for more housing, um, I was excited to see this application again. Um, I've seen it in 2018 when I was on the commission um, and uh, was happy to see it increased in to, from 100 and 60 odd units to 208 units. So great to see that that um, is an additional housing stock for our community. I'm also very happy with the 19 affordable units as well. I'm glad to see that that's there. Um, the other thing I was really excited to see is the mix of studio one, two, and three bedroom units. I think three bedrooms are something that um, we, we need more of for growing families and um, looking at the adjacent use of a daycare, um, what a great amenity for uh, a family that potentially could be you know, working remote and kids go to daycare there. So I think it, it, it would be great um, to have those two uses on one, on one property. Um, overall, I think, you know, those are some of my comments on the on, on the development as a whole. Um, yeah, I don't think I have any other comments. I think overall I'm, I'm in support. Thank you, Commissioner Goldsman. Other comments? Commissioner Albrecht. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, given Commissioner Curry's um, question about the public testimony, I don't wanna um, gloss over that. Um, I appreciate um, the information coming forward and would encourage um, you all to testify at the city council meeting as well where they have a little more um, discretion on 
some of these issues um, because similar to Commissioner Goldsman, um, the findings <coughs> here are made. And um, uh, whereas I, you know, am concerned about some of the items that you brought up, um, our discretion is um, kind of minimal in terms of what we can and can't do. Uh, however, a additional housing, like Commissioner Goldsman said, is important for the city of Bloomington. I think also daycare and safe uh, facilities for our kids are also very, very important, and the demand for daycare facilities is very high. So good to see both of these um, two uses uh, for the city of Bloomington, especially in such a uh, an area where uh, it's easy to get to and from uh, for a lot of jobs elsewhere. So um, I am in support of the application and would also encourage um, public testimony uh, for the city council. Thank you, Commissioner Albrecht. Um, a couple of things I thought about when I was reviewing this. Um, you know, I, I generally find it to be a good proposal. It, as much as I wish an office tower could go here, it's not reasonable to think that. It's been vacant for 17 years. We all know where the office market is at right now. It's not going to happen. And so I think this is a, a fine application. Um, I am a little sensitive to the flexibility requested on density. You know, when I think about density, I'm more sensitive to some places than others. And for those Planning Commission super fans out there, they might know that I'm very sensitive to it in Bloomington Central Station and in South Loop. Um, another place I am sensitive to it is along 494. Um, that is a place for high-density development. It's, a, it's the right type of project in the right location, and I do find that those, are, those parcels abutting 494 are the most um, welcoming towards high density. Um, so as much as I wish this met all of our floor area ratio requirements, I think when you look at the plans and look at it practically, that daycare is not that big, and it's almost just more of a it's a quirky site, and I think there's justification for not meeting the density there. Sure, I wish it, it met the FAR, but I think the public benefit here is greater than any loss in density that we might see. The other flexibility being requested is the parking deviation. I think particularly noting that the applicants said they plan to hang on to this and operate it themselves, um, I think that's that's good justification that they're not going to underpark their own site, particularly at a place where there is literally zero street parking available. So I trust the applicant has done their homework and is not going to underpark their own site. So with that, I am supportive of this application tonight. Commissioner Curry. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, uh, I guess I would mirror uh, Commissioner Albrecht's comments and I you know, fully appreciate the commentary made tonight and, um, you know, it's not, uh, it's not something, I guess, that we can get into, so I'd encourage you to go speak with the city council as well. Um, in terms of the application specifically, uh, the Florida area ratio shortage, my questions earlier regarding the subdivision were kind of were directed towards what does ultimately the Florida area ratio become, and um, I think, and I guess I don't really have a problem with it. I think at, you know, at some point it's going to be much closer to what it's intended to be. So um, in terms of parking, I think, you know, the two uses kind of complement each other in terms of uh, the times that parking is needed during the day. And it sounds like guest parking, which I have actually heard of a project um, that I have had some involvement with. I didn't create it or anything, but... Uh, <laughs> I uh, heard some complaints from tenants that there was no guest parking, and that was a major problem. So I appreciate uh, the applicants' comments regarding guest parking and that and their concern about any sort of parking shortage. So no concerns about the parking there, and also think, yeah, we definitely need more housing in Bloomington. So I'm in support. Very well. We've all had a chance to speak. Does anyone want to have a second go here? Commissioner Albrecht. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm happy to make a motion, if that's helpful. Please. Uh, in case PL2023-193, having been able to make the required findings, I move to recommend approval of preliminary and final development for a five-story, 208-unit apartment building and detached 11,000-square-foot daycare space at 
6701 West 78th Street, subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. Second. We have a motion and a second for approval, uh, recommended approval, of preliminary and final development plans at 6701 West 78th Street. Any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion passes 4-0. Commissioner Albrecht. Thank you, Chair. In case PL2023-193, having been able to make the required findings, I move to recommend approval of a conditional use permit for an 11,000 square foot daycare at 6701 West 78th Street, subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. Second. We have a motion and a second to recommend approval of a conditional use permit at the same site. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion passes 4-0. This item will move to the City Council on February 12th as a consent item, and I want to clarify what that means. The City Council, as opposed to the Planning Commission, has um, some of their items as consent, which means they're not brought up for discussion. However, an item can be taken off the consent agenda where there would be an opportunity to provide that testimony we heard this evening, which has been encouraged. So. If you are hoping to provide testimony at the city council, the way that would work is you would reach out to a city council member and ask them to remove that from the consent agenda so you can provide that testimony. And those email addresses are available online and certainly the planning department could also help you with that. Okay. Thank you, Planning Commission. We'll move on to item number two, which is also a public hearing, and that's uh, by the city of Bloomington as the applicant. It's a city code amendment uh, for the sign code update. Senior Planner Nick Johnson, we have you here at City Hall. Welcome. Good to see you all. Thank you, Acting Chair. Pull up my slides here. Um, while I'm doing that, oops, we just had Londell's uh, retirement party, so Londell pees for the super fans. <laughs> um, he uh, just ended a long and uh, great career here for 30 years, so thanks to him, and he helped with this project a lot too. I'm um, sorry. Okay, here we go. Thanks for your patience. So this is the uh, this is the public hearing. This is the third time we've been before you uh, on the sign ordinance project. Um, uh, we've done two prior uh, study sessions, um, and uh, the reason that we're doing this is that a uh, the project is on the planning commission work plan, both for 2023 and 2024. Uh, but as you know, the, plan, the city sign ordinance has not been uh, substantially updated since 1996, and there's been a significant amount of uh, changes in uh, case law surrounding expression, but also just changes in best practices, changes in technology, uh, changes in a number of different things uh, that uh, touch on signage. And uh, just for the audience and for as a reminder for uh, the Planning Commission, um, uh, the balance points uh, typical in uh, sign ordinances is a balance between expression, which in many cases is good. Both commercial and non-commercial messages are really helpful and important, um, uh, but also trying to strike a balance of public safety, uh, the, the built environment, the aesthetics of the built environment, and trying to manage uh, visual clutter uh, and limit commercialism in non-commercial areas. Uh, those are some of the things uh, to think about as we go through this. So here is a basic agenda of what I intend to talk about. Because we did a uh, pretty robust presentation of the draft sign code back in November, I'm going to try and focus more on uh, some of the changes and some of the big picture uh, policy changes that this ordinance would uh, bring to you um, if adopted. So here's a basic agenda of the things uh, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on. Just looking at um, uh, the process and timeline that we've gone through, so again, this process really started in 2022 uh, with the initial um, uh, engagement and uh, uh, research components. Uh, but we came before the Planning Commission and City Council in January of 2023. Uh, at that study session, we attempted to establish uh, kind of broad or high level uh, policy direction and a number of different questions that pertain to signs. We used that direction, we did a polling exercise and we used some of that direction uh, to kind of help uh, sharpen um, the decision points that we made in terms of drafting and researching the sign code. So from February, September, just that's uh, really the heart of the research and drafting period. Um, we did do uh, a little bit of a, we took a little bit of a right turn uh, and worked on uh, mural standards. Murals 
uh, were embedded in the sign code, uh, and we made a determination that it was uh, prudent to take murals out of the sign ordinance and establish uh, separate uh, mural standards. Uh, and we did that uh, in August of last year. Uh, and it went through its own public hearing process. You all were involved in that. Um, uh, just recently in November, uh, we presented the first uh, full draft of our new sign code, uh, both to the Planning Commission and City Council. Um, I'll add that we've been uh, pretty consistent in trying to reach uh, different sectors of the public as part of this process throughout the entirety uh, of the year uh, and had gotten a lot of feedback, gotten some good feedback. Uh, so I was certainly appreciative of the people who've uh, leaned in and provided um, uh, engagement in that regard. Uh, and then here, here we are tonight, uh, public hearings in February uh, of this year. Um, and something I'll talk a little bit about at the end of my presentation, uh, but staff is recommending uh, circling back on this policy uh, probably a year out um, should the city adopt the new sign code. But I'll talk a little bit more about that. So we've uh, presented this slide all three times. Forgive me for the duplication, but I just want to reiterate that uh, the decision points that we've made throughout the process uh, have attempted to uh, check the box or uh, advance the ball on these three matters. One, we want to conform with current legal standards. Um, uh, we'll talk about the, the aspect, the legal aspects in a moment. Um, we want to improve the clarity and reduce complexity uh, as staff kind of utilizing this ordinance over the years. We've uh, noted a number of times where there can be conflicting provisions or just, uh, it's just too hard to find the information uh, that you're looking for. And on that note, we did want to improve the organization and formatting, uh, improve the user experience, and uh, adopt kind of an organizational structure that's more consistent with uh, model ordinances or best practices that we've uh, observed or obtained. So I just want to uh, point out these three things. Um, on the legal front, so this is the um, first ordinance I've worked on uh, where the legal department was a direct partner in the drafting, um, and that has to do just with the complexity around the First Amendment and expression. Um, uh, and this is the sign ordinance is an intersection of uh, First Amendment and expression and land use law. So that's what really ramps up the complexity uh, is that not only are you dealing with uh, zoning matters, but you're dealing with some of these constitutional matters that uh, make it complicated. So there's been some recent case, uh, cases, as I mentioned, even up to the, the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, uh, that have forced or required cities to reexamine their signage uh, ordinances uh, and make sure that, um, A, they're not uh, creating different standards based on content, um, that they're treating non-commercial speech uh, just as favorably, if not more favorably, than commercial speech, uh, and that there's not undue discretion in some of the city's decision-making based on content of signs, uh, basically. So not only were we uh, directly partnering with uh, the legal department, Kevin Toski, uh, with myself, um, we also uh, contracted with uh, a nationally recognized expert, John Baker with Green Espel. Uh, he not only reviewed our existing sign code, um, uh, in kind of the midpoint of the year and pointed out um, several of the red flags that don't pass uh, today's uh, kind of legal landscape. Uh, he also reviewed our draft ordinance and some of the changes I'll talk about since we, um, he did that in December, some of the updates I'll talk about um, uh, from your last draft you reviewed in November is a direct result of his review, uh, just kind of uh, clarifying and cleaning some things up. Um, so yeah, I feel really good about uh, this aspect. I think we've approached it with um, uh, the urgency and the um, caution that it requires. So the ordinance itself is 140 pages long. Um, it's a long document. Um, most of it is the deletion of the existing signed ordinance, which is over 80 pages long. Um, so that tells you something about our existing sign code. Um, but uh, in order to kind of help the public consumption of the full ordinance, we did create a uh, summary table of just all the different changes of all the different code sections that uh, were amended. But uh, we did want to provide a summary as well and some of the most uh, maybe significant changes. So we did move the currently the variance provisions both for zoning, all zoning variances are in Chapter 2 under the Planning Commission section. We did create some specific findings and uh, uh, provisions that relate to sign variances, and we moved that into the sign ordinance. Um, we did make a few definition changes. There were a few things um, that A, were redundant between our general definition section or just needed to be uh, some undefined terms uh, or some other considerations as it related to signs. Uh, and then um, we did delete uh, both the full existing billboard section uh, and the sign code in chapter 19. And then of course we have the new sign code, which does include billboard standards 
uh, proposed in Chapter 21. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the majority of these changes are just a lot of cross-references. The sign code is referenced in many different areas of the uh, full city code, um, as well as the Appendix A, which is the fee schedule. So there's some procedural or process things that also had to be updated. So in terms of uh, what some of the notable, notable policy changes are from the new sign code to our existing sign code, um, I don't intend to touch on all these topics. I just add them uh, here for bullets for your consideration. And if you have specific, if you or the public have specific questions about these things, I can certainly go into more uh, detail in terms of uh, what they mean. Um, but the bulleted list in front of you are uh, what we deemed as uh, kind of being a significant departure from how the existing sign code um, uh, deals with signs uh, in various ways. So since you reviewed the full uh, draft in November, I wanted to point out uh, some of these changes that we made. Um, we did move all of the temporary sign um, uh, the uh, provisions. Those kind of followed at a list format, similar to our existing sign code. Uh, and we moved those into a table. Hopefully it's a little bit more digestible and uh, easier to read. Um, uh, circling back to the John Baker review, our uh, contracted uh, attorney, um, he did note a few instances where there was possibility of commercial speech actually exceeding uh, non allowances for non-commercial speech, and so that's a no-no uh, in today's environment. And so we did have to make some adjustments to the size allowances, uh, and in some cases the number allowances to our uh, temporary signs. So um, I, I don't have exactly every specific uh, sign type um, of the temporary signs, but in effect, what the draft in front of you does is that it ensures that uh, for every uh, commercial type of temporary sign, there's also allowances for non-commercial speech along those lines. And that's, in the new legal environment, that's just something that cities are really going to have to live with and embrace and um, be okay with, and that's okay. Um, expression, uh, for the most part, is good. So, um, yeah. Electronic changeable copy uh, dwell time, this was a... Uh, this was a clarification that in the previous draft of the sign ordinance, the existing sign code uh, establishes its dwell times not just by changeable copy and uh, electronic graphic display. It also actually has a uh, stipulation that the changeable copy signs uh, must be 10 words or less. And the researcher, the reasoning behind that uh, is that back when those amendments were made in 2006, actually is when the city updated its uh, electronic sign standards, uh, and the research reflects this today as well, is just that more uh, longer uh, messages or messages with more text, uh, more words, uh, have a higher propensity of uh, driver distraction or concerns about um, public safety uh, for the traveling pu public. And so uh, the city adopted those standards in 2006. We attempted, attempted to present, carry those same considerations forward uh, in our November draft um, but we, uh, because we were striving to create le uh, um, less complexity, uh, we omitted that component. But it turns out that component is actually fairly uh, important in terms of how the, that standard was originally adopted. So we added that back in, um, and so it would be uh, changeable copy, 10 words or less. So shorter messages are subject uh, to that eight seconds. The longer messages and graphics would be uh, reduced to 10 minutes, likely, like we previously talked about. Um, in essence, what that uh, decision point uh, was in 2006 is it reflected a compromise in, in terms of trying to uh, maintain, um, uh, you know, uh, control of public safety to a degree. Again, traffic safety being the most important thing, uh, but also have some allowances for uh, shorter dwell times for more limited messages, which are used by private and the public um, uh, actors as well. So billboard electronic uh, conversion, uh, that was one additional update since your, uh, um, since your review in November. And uh, I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but basically what it had to do with is when it had, it, it's a connection point to nonconformity standards for signs. When you increase the size of the cabinet of a existing billboard, that is in effect violating nonconformity um, uh, considerations because you're increasing the size of it, you're expanding it. And so what we, uh, there was some discussion at the council level uh, that there should be mechanisms to allow for electronic conversion of our four existing billboards in Bloomington. Uh, so in effect, what we did is we created an exception uh, for the conversion of existing uh, billboards uh, to electronic. So that's, that's in the draft. 
those are the main uh, updates. Otherwise, it, the draft, for the most part, reflects what you saw uh, in November. There's, you know, little uh, tweaks here and there, but I just, that's kind of the bigger items. So at, at uh, Planning Commission last time, um, there was a request in order to provide, uh, we provided some of this anecdotally as well as just in the text of our staff report, um, but the Planning Commission requested this that we provide a summary table of uh, dwell time and electronic sign standards for uh, various communities. So dwell time is a big, uh, certainly a big piece of that. Um, I will say that uh, some cities have different standards for billboards, you know, and, and other aspects of their code separate from their sign ordinance. So we did try to capture those uh, in those communities, but acknowledge that it's possible that some of the cities studied uh, may have billboard standards that we did not catch. Uh, but this is more focused on sign ordinances, but although for cities we were aware of separate billboard standards, we did include that in, the, in how this is reflected. Um, but this is just a sampling of 14 cities. It gives you, uh, you know, different things to look at. Um, uh, one thing I would note is that while some cities have uh, very minimal dwell time, some of those cities also uh, really uh, limit the size of, that electronic signs can be. Some of them have proportionality requirements, stating that electronic signs can only be a certain proportion of a freestanding sign, for example. And so uh, it's kind of easy to look apples to apples at the dwell time alone without seeing this other stuff that's happening uh, kind of uh, behind the curtain. Um, like St. Louis Park, for example, I don't want to pick on them. Three seconds, that's a very low dwell time. They also have very uh, um, strong limitations about where electronic signs can be and uh, how big they can be. They have, they're one of those cities that has a proportionality, for example. So uh, just wanted to point that out. And then just for a summary aspect, um, uh, as far as what this draft reflects for electronic signs, again, what we're talking about is a max 150 square foot size, a dwell time of limited text, eight seconds, graphics and larger text, 10 minutes, a buffer of residen uh, to residential uses of 100 feet, and then a nighttime restriction when located within 150 feet of uh, uh, residential uses. So that's what the draft says. Uh, looking at this a different way, um, uh, this is kind of the... Uh, environment, regulatory environment about just specific to dwell times right around Bloomington. So you see a very big range, like I've talked about before. Uh, you have a couple cities that are at 60 minutes, which is a significant amount of time, uh, in Prairie at 20 minutes, and then you have a collection of cities, uh, Savage at 20 minutes, and then you have uh, Burnsville, Egan, Richfield, uh, the, the Mac property, um, that have uh, lower dwell times, um, and in some cases allow lower dwell times through what's called an enhanced dynamic display permit or other mechanisms um, that basically incentivize, uh, you know, certain activities or actions uh, on the part of uh, um, applicants, uh, either by reducing signage or uh, locating signage in order to gain um, uh, lower dwell times. Um, but yeah, those are those are kind of the numbers. I, I state that because uh, people drive on the roads, they walk on the streets, or they say, "Why is it uh, different right there?" But it's not right there, and the reason is because local jurisdictions have authority over this, and they regulate it all differently. Um, you will hear people talk about you know certain federal standards or state standards, um, and that's not to discredit those things. But it's not a preemption type issue where uh, a standard is set and then local jurisdictions can't regulate. Cities have the right uh, to regulate this issue. Uh, and many do, um, and uh, once again, similar to 2006 or 1996, the city will have to make a decision about where it wants to go. And again, just thinking about that balance between expression and then traffic safety, you know, it's, it's kind of the, the balance there. So we've done a fair amount of public engagement as part of this process. Uh, we've engaged a lot with internal partners because, again, as, I've, as I kind of mentioned, that signs touch all different areas of the city code. It touches all of our different departments, too. Um, you know, election signs, park, park signs, um, uh, building addressing with, you know, public safety uh, professionals. Uh, there's just a lot of different things. Um, our environmental health staff uh, runs our temporary uh, sign permit process. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, the traffic staff. So there's a lot of different players in this. Um, uh, on the external side, uh, we've done uh, a number of surveys with other cities. We've uh, surveyed our sign installers. That work was all done kind of earlier uh, last year. Um, but since that time, we've uh, reached out directly to a lot of trade associations that have an interest in signage. You can see some of their uh, logos there on the left. Uh, and then similar to other long-range planning projects, we've had a consistent uh, online engagement presence. We have had some engagement through that as well. And we've tried to uh, be diligent about providing 
project updates on that page. And then since that time, um, thankfully, uh, we're happy when people reach out to us and want to talk to us about our draft codes. We've had a few meetings uh, directly with people, uh, and we appreciate the feedback that they've provided us. Um, uh, and so that, that's helpful. Uh, we have received some correspondence. We've gotten five letters on the uh, draft sign code. Um, uh, the staff report tried to provide a summary and kind of just general considerations from a staff perspective about kind of the things that some of these parties are asking for. Um, uh, Walzer Toyota inquiring about uh, the number of signs on parking structures, Clear Channel Outdoor, uh, interested in the ability uh, for billboard digital conversion. Again, I think the new code might lay that issue to rest. Um, uh, I think it does lay that issue to rest, but just want to note that. Um, they did make some recommendations about sign brightness, and then uh, there is some uh, request to reduce electronic sign dwell times. Um, and I, on this point, Clear Channel operates in the billboard space, and I do want to note the sign code does have different standards. It's a flat 10 minutes, not, uh, not a uh, eight seconds for reduced amounts of text. And so that's also uh, a consideration about the size of those signs, and that's a carryover from the, previous, the existing sign code, which currently is 20 minutes. Um, but the considerations that go into that have to do with the sign size, the volume of traffic uh, that are seeing those, and the travel speeds that they're operating at. Um, as far as Krauss Anderson, um, had a good meeting with them. Um, uh, they had five issues, or was it, it might have been six, five issues that they identified. Uh, temporary signs for commercial promotions, you know, this is an area, if you uh, read their letter, uh, something that I think we can be a little bit more flexible and creative about in terms of expanding uh, the, the day's allowance based on the number of tenants. If it's of interest to the Planning Commission, I'll certainly wait till uh, later if requested, but if it's of interest to the Planning Commission on that issue, I, I think I have a concept of uh, something could, that could get closer uh, to what I think Krauss Anderson is looking for. We might not be in perfect alignment on the number of days, but we're uh, getting closer. Um, the maximum individual building sign size, that is a, a notable policy change from the existing code, actually establishing a maximum for an individual sign. Uh, building signage allowance in the class five sign district, so that's our mixed use uh, zoning districts. Uh, the maximum monument uh, at, or pylon sign size, uh, the cap. Um, and then electronic uh, sign size and dwell times as well is an is an area of interest for them. And fast signs, and I know some of those folks are here tonight, so I shouldn't speak uh, for them more than I already have. So forgive me. Um, but uh, fast signs also provided a letter. They are a local sign installer. They had an inquiry about the electronic sign dwell time. Um, uh, they they had an interesting consideration about uh, varied dwell times within an indiv individual sign. If you vary the message within the actual um, uh, electronic message, which was creative, but um, I think difficult from a regulatory perspective. Um, varied, uh, they did make a comment about the varied dwell times in terms of the quantity of text, and they had a question about feather flags. Feather flags are permitted in the existing sign ordinance, I believe, and certain, and for sure are in the new sign code, so I think that issue is likely uh, resolved as well. And then finally, later to, uh, earlier today, the Minneapolis Regional Chamber also submitted a letter that was emailed to you. I think you might have a printed copy of it. Thank you, Elliot. Um, uh, that uh, they also recommend reducing the dwell time uh, on digital billboards to eight seconds. So in terms of next steps, um, uh, you know, following the hearing uh, that you will hold here this evening, should you uh, make a recommendation uh, tonight, we would have to hold a public hearing at the city council. Um, if you were to take action tonight, that would be on February 26th. Um, if the council uh, moves to adopt, uh, a new sign standards or the new sign code. Uh, we then would have to go through a process of updating a lot of our uh, permitting processes and kind of informational materials on our website. We have a lot of stuff out there on our existing sign code. Uh, and then finally, the thing that I put in bold is just that with uh, when you're replacing a um, kind of uh, a policy that is as complex or expansive as something like signs, when you're talking about changing the methodology methodologies by which how signs are calculated, uh, doing a lot of new different uh, things in terms of a departure from the existing code. I think it's prudent in this case to have, uh, to commit to the public and commit uh, to uh, property owners and businesses to do a look, uh, a review one year after the fact. Um, and uh, uh, what we would do basically over the course of that year is track uh, the various sign permits we reviewed 
and take special note of instances where uh, if we had any difficulties with the new provisions uh, in terms of inconsistency with the desired uh, signage outcomes or proposals of the property owners, uh, we'd be able to provide uh, you and the city council that information in some form. Um, and then at that time, if, you know, if directed by planning commissioner or council, if we had needed to make some adjustments, we certainly could do that. So I do want to highlight that. With that, uh, I do have a recommended motion language, and I'm happy to take uh, questions. Great. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. <clears throat> this is a public hearing, so we'll go through our normal process, starting with questions for staff. Commissioner Albrecht. Uh, thank you, Chair. Mr. Johnson, <clears throat> my question is related to the digital conversion of billboards, and the recommendation is around... Uh, um, a certain number of feet from residential property. Was there a discussion around um, the proximity to hotels, given that there are a lot of them uh, on the 494 corridor directly abutting billboards? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Commissioner Albrecht. Uh, so there wasn't discussion specifically about that. Uh, again, we have four uh, legally nonconforming billboards in Bloomington. Um, uh, the new sign code did not, does not propose to expand that allowance in terms of adding new ones. Uh, so um, the existing policy and if the draft policy were adopted, four is kind of the number. Um, but we didn't look at hotels. I would sh I would share that uh, uh, what kind of governs um, uh, hotels currently aren't a use from a proximity standpoint in our current sign code um, that warrant special um, consideration with respect to the operation of digital signs. So that would be a new um, policy if we were to look at that. Uh, the other thing I was going to share is that the city's lighting ordinance, so you'll actually sometimes see some cross-references in the sign code to the lighting ordinance. And the reason for that is that our brightness uh, restrictions are actually not in the sign code. They're in the uh, lighting ordinance. Um, and uh, the consideration of those brightness uh, elements, there is reductions in brightness when in proximity to residential uses, but there's currently no consideration for hotels in our lighting ordinance. Yep. Mr. Johnson, I have a question. Um, going back to the billboards, and you mentioned that the, uh, the last time this came before us, it was not on the table to allow them to convert to digital, and now it sounds like they are. And I believe you said that was at uh, the wishes of the council. So I just want to clarify that point. Some of the things you presented before us were doing for legal reasons. It sounds like this may not be a legal reason that we are allowing to that digital conversion. Is that correct? Yeah, Chair. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Cookton. Uh, so uh, with respect to the legal analysis, um, uh, this is really getting into the weeds of nonconformity. Uh, but you could envision that you could be not expanding the actual uh, width or height of a billboard, but because the cabinet size has to increase, technically it is a physical expansion. And so uh, we as a staff, before we even explored this matter, uh, kind of more diligently were unsure in terms of what state nonconformity standards would say about uh, the conversion of an electronic sign. So whether or not we were, we were kind of operating under the uh, assumption, the potential assumption, uh, that there could be uh, merits for a conversion if you're just going based off the, the standard state statute. Um, and so uh, we looked into that further. That's kind of where you caught us, that we didn't think you could do it because it is a physical expansion, um, if you're talking about substantially equivalent under the nonconformity law. Um, and so when, as we were discussing that with city council, um, I think there was, and I don't want to state that they didn't take a formal uh, vote on it or a separate motion, like we want to allow for uh, the conversion of digital billboards. It's just there was some discussion on it. Staff interpreted that discussion uh, to be that uh, we should look at it. So we changed it in the draft. Um, it certainly uh, does not have to go forward with that. It's just we were trying to uh, read what the policy direction was we were being given. Mr. Tusk. Thanks, Chair. Commissioners, I, I can just add a little bit to the, the state nonconformity law. It does specifically um, allow cities to allow expansions of nonconformity by ordinance. So that's what you see in the draft ordinance. So um, it is, it's allowing an expansion to digital um, displays, provided it meets all the other um, requirements of the ordinance. So there's a maximum size, there's a length, um, brightness, all those different things will have to meet, but it would be allowed um, without violating our nonconformity section. So just to add some 
context to that. Thanks. Other questions for staff? Commissioner Goldsman. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to clarify on, I've got two questions, but to clarify on the billboard, regardless of the number of words on it, the graphics, it's, it's agnostic of that, it would only be allowed to change every 10 minutes. Is that correct? Yeah, Chair. Uh, Commissioner Goldsman, that's correct. If the new code was adopted, currently the standard is 20 minutes. Okay. If I may ask. Please. Please. Thank you. Um, one thing that you didn't cover tonight um, that we've talked about in previous meetings um, is really t the allowance of um, multiple sign types on mm -hmm. the front of uh, properties, uh, multi-tenant properties, mm -hmm. um, i.e. like a strip mall. Yep. Um, can you talk a little bit about the historical discussions around different sign types being allowed versus currently they're not allowed. Yeah, thank you. Chair Commissioner Goldsman. so um, I can't, uh, I don't know if it was within the 1996 version of the code that it dates all the way back to or if it has been a subsequent change uh, since then. I don't know that off the top of my head, but uh, basically what you will see in some sign ordinances of certain communities is that they will require uh, uniformity of sign type uh, when mounted on a multi-tenant building so that they don't have kind of varying aesthetics of their sign types on a, on a given building. And then you will see other cities that don't regulate that. Um, we had this discussion with you, of course, uh, but we also had this discussion and the reason that uh, it was continued to not uh, include that requirement, whereas our existing sign code does include uniformity of sign construction today, is that city council did provide clear policy guidance in that regard based on their discussion uh, to, to eliminate that. And uh, I think I had a six point, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, plan as to why uh, staff thinks that that's uh, wise. I don't know if I can recite all six points, but I can uh, tell you is that in order to regulate uh, uniformity of construction, basically you have to have a, uh, what's currently called as a uniform sign design plan, but you have to establish a regulatory mechanism and approval on a property that, sign, that staff can use and that uh, disallows sign installers from uh, installing certain sign types. So that's one piece is just added like regulatory complexity and cost of going through that process. It also adds time to establish those. Uh, the second piece of it uh, was just that some business logo types or messages don't match up well with channel construction types. They, they literally need a cabinet. And under our existing sign code, uh, cab the cabinet component of a sign is limited to 25% of the full sign area. And so basically it doesn't translate well um, to uh, certain businesses. Um, uh, one of the other considerations that we talked about at City Council is that those sign types, uh, just by the nature of their construction, tend to be quite a bit more expensive uh, than cabinet sign types. So staff had equity concerns about that um, in terms of is it really a valuable uh, or legitimate use of um, uh, I guess, government power, for lack of a better term, uh, to be dictating uh, what types of signs businesses would have to uh, install on their building. There was a couple other ones. I'm uh, failing to forget my six-point plan. I wouldn't be a good uh, elected official, I guess. Uh, but um, I don't know if I'm... Equity? No, yeah, we talked about that one. Oh, yes. Um, but yeah, so I kind of presented those facts to you and the city council before, uh, and they agreed uh, to move forward without that. Um, we recognize that uh, in some instances there is some uh, potential uh, harms to the, uh, you know, aesthetic that can occur. But some of those things can be more preferential than subjective, say. Is that a fair summary? Any other questions for staff? Commissioner Curry. Thank you, Chair. A uh, couple questions. So the Cross Anderson uh, letter, I mean, I've read this point and understand that for buildings with multiple tenants, I don't know, probably three or more, five or more, the update could be too restrictive. So what is the plan then? It sounds like you guys are maybe still working on something or is that finalized and is there a point at which that might need to be reviewed in the future? Can you just explain that further? Yeah, uh, Chair Commissioner Curry, so what we did is uh, we had some meetings with Kraus, and we have a good relationship with Kraus, and so we had a very good open uh, dialogue, and they expressed some concerns about how some of the new standards uh, could impact some of their multi-tenant uh, retail properties uh, in Bloomington, and I, I value their feedback. Um, on 
Uh, what we tried to do in the staff report is to try and provide a summary of kind of where staff is kind of uh, more in alignment maybe with what they're requesting. And I think that focuses more on the temporary sign uh, proposal. Uh, and then the, what they expressed elsewhere is the uh, you know, concern about uh, maximum size of freestanding signs, not along the highway of uh, 100 square feet. Um, and I do have some examples of um, kind of sign areas of some different signs in town if you want to take a look at them as an extra slide. Um, uh, but in addition to that, uh, also that uh, on our building signs, um, they have some centers that are in, would be in the new class three sign district, which is our B2, our general commercial and industrial areas. But they also have uh, a property <coughs> uh, located in uh, that zone B4, which is one of the city's mixed use zoning districts. And one of the concepts the ordinance has for building signs is that it's a slightly lower allowance for sign area in a mixed use environment than a general commercial environment, more auto oriented type development, if that makes sense. Um, and so uh, we, we recognize those things. And some of, some of the properties that are zoned uh, mixed use today, you know, may be envisioned via a district plan or the city's comprehensive plan to take on uh, a new form as time goes on and redevelopment occurs. Um, but might have a more auto-oriented um, uh, site today. I mean, that's, that's kind of the nature of planning, right, is that you're going to have uh, restrictions or plans uh, that don't perfectly uh, marry up with the existing condition. Um, what I've tried to express to um, uh, Kraus Anderson and others is that, A, all the existing signs you have, if the city were to adopt this ordinance, are going to be legally nonconforming. And so as long as you replace them in a substantially equivalent way, you can continue to have bigger signs. B, some of the signs that exist in the community actually exceed the existing sign code. And that, was ha that happened through PD flexibility or variances or other tools that are still available um, uh, to property owners today. And so don't, don't automatically assume, in other words, that all the signs that exist in Bloomington today meet the existing sign code, because that's not true. There has been variances and other things that have been done. Um, and then the other, th I mean, the other thing, I didn't want to make a big deal out about this, but the environment uh, of signs just from the 1990s to right now is just very different. Everyone has a computer in their pocket with a map app that tells them which, where every single business is. And so it's not to devalue the need for uh, commercial messages. Commercial messages are obviously very important uh, for businesses to be successful. But the environments, the regulatory environments of the 1990s um, uh, is just different in light today and different in light of what technology we all have, most of us have, and uh, the ability to go to those properties and navigate to those properties quite easily and learn about businesses. So um, we're trying to create a sign ordinance for the next 20 years. Um, uh, but uh, so I recognize that, uh, you know, some of the allowances might be uh, off from the perspective of uh, Krauss Anderson, who's an important uh, retail uh, property owner in Bloomington. Um, but uh, that's also part of the reason why we're committed to this one-year look back is because we want to actually put this into, uh, into action and see how it performs. So that was probably a little more than you were <laughs> bargaining for. Sorry. Yes. It, thank you. Uh, um, so I guess going back to the multi-tenant uh, temporary sign situation. Yeah. It, I mean, I think one of the things the city council actually asked us about specifically was small businesses. And if there are temporary signs for new businesses coming into the city, we obviously want to be as supportive as possible. Uh, so I guess are we a, a long ways off from what they're thinking is appropriate and what we have, what we are um, proposing, or are we relatively close yeah. in terms of temporary sign specifically? Chair Commissioner Curry, where I'd say we're more close, or where we are aligned, is that we think we agree with Kraus that uh, larger. Uh, multi-tenant um, uh, sites uh, should be uh, consideration should be made for those sites for more days of temporary signage to be allowed and keep in mind with uh, how it's set up um, today the existing sign code tracks both days and occurrences we're getting rid of the occurrences it's just it's uh, it's extraneous it's it's, over, it's not necessary uh, in my view um, so what we're going to is just a day standard. And the way that this is set up is that, um, you know, you might have five, you know, five tenants who all have uh, banners on their tenant space. Uh, and it's not just because there's five of them. If it's on the same day, it still counts as one day. So I just want to make that point clear. Um, where, so we're in, we're in alignment that uh, um, multi-tenant sites like Southtown, which has over 30 tenants, that's unique, right? That's not common to have that many tenants. 
there should be more days. Um, so we, you know, I, this is, uh, just, this is just track changed of the existing sign code. You know, it's an alternative proposal. It's an option B, if you will, um, where staff, uh, I think the Krauss letter suggested 240 days, uh, which is well over half the year. Um, staff would be uh, supportive of looking at half the year, 180 days. Um, and I think part of that too, is just based on the experience that, um, the, existing provisions that exist today have not been limiting. That's not the feedback we've gotten, that, that today's ordinance is absolutely unreasonable, and today's ordinance has stronger restrictions than what this is that I'm showing you here. Sure. So we're in alignment that uh, consideration should be paid for more multi-tenant, for larger multi-tenant sites. It's just I think we're a little off on the days, but I, I think I see that as a minor discrepancy. Okay, that's great. Um, then I guess my only other... I guess it's it was it's been a concern or it was a concern last time is just electronic signs facing residential like we've got a hundred foot distance uh, with a night or a nighttime restriction. I mean, is there anything stopping somebody from putting up a sign a hundred feet from somebody's living room that just directs right into their living room? Present. Yeah, so Chair, Commissioner Curry, um, they'd have to be 101 feet uh, to do that. 100 foot is the, uh, you can't be within 100 feet. Um, but this is a policy choice that the city uh, will have to make in that we saw cities that actually require the signs to be extinguished, turned off, if they're within 150 feet. Um, that's kind of our current orientation standard. So if you're between 101 and 150 feet, uh, you know, and the, the distances are different in other cities. Some of them are only 50 or some of them have different distances. But uh, the point is they, they suggest extinguish the sign during the night. A few other cities we saw said extinguish them or make them static, meaning they don't change. And the reason being is that it's the changes, it's the changing light uh, and the constant changing messages that uh, basically create more of the nuisance to a residential property than just a static and a keeping in mind that we have brightness uh, limitations. Um, when closer to residential, um, it's that's kind of more the issue is the changing nature of the message. So the draft has allows them to stay on, but they have to be uh, static after 9 p.m. from 9 to 7, 9 p.m. to 7 a.m. Okay. Um. The city could, sorry, the city could uh, suggest that they just be extinguished, but and maybe a consideration for the council um, or just. Um, uh, it does require more enforcement on the part of city staff at nighttime, which is not typical staff operating hours. And so doing, like we do lighting inspections, we do um, uh, sign brightness inspections, uh, you're adding an additional potential nighttime activity from a code enforcement perspective because some people will decide not to comply. Have there been any areas in the city that um, planning's looked at uh, that have highlighted any potential specific um, neighboring uses where that could be a concern, such as, uh, I don't know, I think maybe Penn Avenue where you've got industrial properties on one side and then I think residential on the other side. Is that, have you guys looked at that at all? It, yes, it, uh, Chair Commissioner Curry, it has come up. Um, and uh, that's, I mean, that in effect is why we have a sign brightness limitation uh, because all typically all these signs have dimmers on them, uh, and if left unregulated, some of some, not all, but some property owners will turn them uh, up to be quite bright. And we've had issues with uh, interior building lighting and other uses. Um, and this also relates to um, the discussion about a maximum sign size, uh, too. It also informs that because um, some of the experiences we've had in that regard um, relate to that as well. But yes, um, that's why it's just important to be diligent about sign brightness and how it can impact uh, residential uses. But most of the complaints we get are not about changing messages or those types of things. I mean, there's not many electronic signs right in uh, residential neighborhoods. I can think of a few occasions with place of assembly and things, but um, uh, there, it's more brightness issues and how light is uh, thrown or cast right at residential properties. So it's more intensity. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? And Mr. Johnson, I just want to clarify for the Planning Commission, the slide that's in front of us is not what's in the application. 
That's correct. That, thank you for that clarification. That's correct. This is a staff's uh, audible or option B to look at if uh, the planning commission is in support of expanding allowances for temporary com- or temporary signs for commercial promotions. Thank you. Yep. Okay. In this case, the city is the applicant, so uh, we've heard enough perhaps for Mr. Johnson for a few minutes. Um, uh, and I will then open the public hearing and uh, we'll follow the same rules we talked about with item number one. Uh, but we do welcome that public testimony. So anyone who would like to come up, um, if you haven't signed in already, please do so. If you have signed in, uh, state your name so we know who you are and uh, we'll take your testimony. Both microphones work, so come on up. Well, good evening. My name's Ken Vinji. I'm with Carl Sanderson and uh, I think hello. It, yeah, we got you. okay. And uh, I don't. I've been around for a long time. I grew up in Bloomington. Worked in Bloomington um, for 35 years. Either worked or managed properties for 35 years in Bloomington. Uh, been involved with a lot of different organizations, but the Bloomington Chamber. I still call it the Bloomington Chamber. But uh, worked with them over the 35 years and been in front of city councils and planning commissions and worked with Nick and Glenn actually through the Bloomington Chamber. We would meet with uh, Glenn every month uh, on our public policies uh, committee, and that was before COVID, and going over things that were going on with the city. So I've been a, a kind of a, a spokesperson and, and following along from the business community on what goes on. And with Cross Anderson, we do have a dozen properties in Bloomington and have for a number of years, going back to the Southtown Center and Clover Center. Clover's from the 1950s and Southtown, of course, 1960. And we have a number of properties in different zoning districts from B2, B4, C3, C, C3, C4, and C5. And now with this new sign ordinance, that'd be classes three and classes five. So Cross Anderson, where we are, as Nick said, maybe grandfathered in based on some of the comprehensive plans we already have and also um, through the PDs that we have. But what I really want to do is, as I read through this, is what's reasonable for the business community and for the city. And so that's how I approached it. And so one of the first things that I looked at or caught my eye was the temporary signage. And I had a little different understanding than what the current code says because of how we've applied it over the years at various properties. But for instance, uh, you know, a property like Southtown, it's not unreasonable that you're going to have a multiple uh, multitude of tenants that are going to be moving in and out throughout the, the course of a year. For, um, one example was we had Hancock Fabrics move out of the one end cap, and then we ended up leasing half of it to Petco. And then we relocated Schuler's into the other half of that. Then now that Schuler's was gone from what we called our uh, Newtown section, we ended up splitting that in half and we put in Guitar Center and Five Below. So right there, you know, you'd have four tenants that are all looking for their 60-day signage. That's 240 days just with for four tenants in a property of the size of Southtown. Not to mention, you know, somebody like Party City wanted to have their Halloween sign up, you know, or maybe TJ Maxx or Famous Footwear wanted to do a sidewalk sale or some other tenant moving in like, uh, you know, the joint or something like that. So I just feel that the, the number of days that are needed for temporary signage should be enhanced. And Nick had that slide up there. And maybe... If you could add another section into there and get to the larger section having 240 days, I think that would be uh, more adequate to handle us situations like uh, South Town or Valley West may have. The other sec- the item that I wanted to cover was uh, the size of the signage. Now, uh, as you read through it, uh, based on the different classes and that, but you could get up to 250 square feet. Well, Coles um, has a sign that's 193, and, you know, it looks good there. And also note that it's kind of on a two-story building, so that that adds to, you know, how the sign looks and appears. But Coles is only five letters. How do I – you got it? Now, if you go to, say, a Bed Bath & Beyond, you know, now you're talking 18 characters – but 
my auto order. There we go. Bed Bath and Beyond. You know now now you're talking a, a large a larger sign and that one. Well, it says right up there, 400 square feet. So obviously well above the. 250 that the, would be the new max for the sign criteria but again you know that's almost a, a two-story facade to that and you know looks very well and it is so important for uh, the retail tenants to be able to have uh, the signage that is visible to uh, the customers and uh, in some cases you know passerbys for herberters now that as you know, that that Herberger building's coming down. Oops. Uh, actually, is being demoed right now. And uh, but to just show, you know, the Herberger sign with the rows, you're talking at six over 600 square feet. So again, two-story building. You know, near the freeway. Yeah, again, it it doesn't look, you know. It looks appropriate for for the area, and we don't know what exactly is going to go in that area again. But I'm sure it's going to be, you know, something large, and they are going to be looking for definitely more than a 250 foot sign for that area. Mr. Vengio, I've got you past time, so I'll ask you to uh, work on wrapping it up here if you could, please. Okay, and then just as far as another slide, you know, I'm talking South Town, but you have Valley West and you have Cub Foods, you know, throughout uh, the city. And again, look at their sign, and that's 326 square feet. So I, just trying to be reasonable on what that limit is, and I feel that 250 is way too low. And, you know, you, you have other signs in the cities that I'm, gonna, I'm sure are similar in size. Okay, I think my letter speaks for the rest of it. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Chair, Planning Commissioners. My name is Matthew Weiland. I'm with Clear Channel Outdoor. We own and operate uh, the only billboards in the city of Bloomington. Um, first, certainly want to start off by thanking your city staff. Nick's been great to work with. Certainly recognize this is a huge and complex undertaking you guys are doing. Certainly appreciate some of the comments that we've submitted that have been incorporated. Uh, we are excited and would like the opportunity to upgrade and modernize the billboards we have in town. Really, the only um, issue, the thing I have to discuss is the dwell times. Um, appreciate currently they're at 20 minutes you're recommending 10 what we're requesting is eight seconds eight seconds is our um, industry industry standard for dwell times on billboards this is based on uh, safety studies by the federal highway administration um, so the federal government allows it the state government allows it but as Nick said it is subject to local rules um, safety is our top priority in operating these we know if they didn't operate safe or if we didn't operate them safely we couldn't have them um, the first digital signs that we put in were back in 2006 in Minnetonka. So 18 years ago, we've been operating safely. We currently have 82 digital uh, faces in 22 communities, all with eight second uh, dwell times. Um, the reason, the, one of the ways we operate these safely, if you look at any of these boards, um, they have a webcam sitting out in front of them that points back. The webcams not only prove to our advertisers what we're advertising, but we're always monitoring those boards. So if there ever was any issues with them, we could remotely shut them off. And there hasn't been. Again, we've been operating for 18 years. Around the community right now, uh, we have them in Burnsville, we have them in Minneapolis or in Egan, um, around your community. So you can see how they operate. We really don't want to have them any brighter or operate any differently than the other printed signs you see in the area. Our billboards are located in good industrial commercial corridors, which we also take into account. Uh, the main reasons we want to upgrade our digital boards, um, number one, it's where our industry is going. It allows a lot more flexibility for our advertisers. They can change their message during the day. Uh, number two, it allows us to give way more opportunities for local advertisers in your community without adding more billboards. Uh, and number three, it allows us to further our commitment to the communities we operate in. Every community we're in where we have digital boards, uh, we allow or we provide uh, public messaging. Cities use it for a variety of things from their events, um, their community centers, um, to public education. In addition to um, what we give to cities, we partner with law enforcement and emergency management on public service. Um, we're one of the fastest ways to get an Amber Alert out, for instance, or we partner with the FBI with their fugitives, fugitive most wanted type stuff. Um, and we strategically partner with nonprofits. Um, so we've certainly demonstrated we can operate these safely. Um, 
and I certainly appreciate the opportunity or your consideration on a request at eight seconds. And I think last thing Nick pointed out, uh, you know, we got the support of the Minneapolis Bloomington Chamber of Commerce recognized. We do a lot of work with them and partner with them on a lot of things and certainly appreciate their support for this request as well. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, all the other folks here at City Hall are city staff, and I don't see anyone online. So I will look for a motion to close the public hearing. Uh, motion to close the public hearing. Second. I have a motion and a second to close that public hearing. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we'll move into discussion. Lots to unpack here. <laughs> Commissioner Curry. Thank you, Chair. Um, to be honest, I kind of, uh, you know, Cross Anderson's testimony about the temporary signage I think is important. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I think given the state of where Southtown is at today, I mean, I think we just condemned one of the buildings, right? So I think we should probably put some more consideration into their, and I don't, uh, I mean, the math is beyond me. It's like multiple levels, but uh, how many days, like tenant days uh, of temporary signage can be allowed on a multi-tenant property like that. So I think we should take a closer look at that. Further discussion? Commissioner Albrecht. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Uh, I also was moved by the Cross Anderson testimony, particularly around the square footage of signage. I know um, some companies, I'm sure, um, I can think of one grocery chain actually has very specific standards in which they use to come into communities or not. And I'm not sure if signage would detract from a business deciding to be in Bloomington based on have the requirement to have a smaller sign. Um, but I would be just concerned generally with that idea. Are we going to limit business growth for the city of Bloomington because we have a strict signage square footage. That's all I have to say about that one. Okay, Commissioner Goldsman. I don't, I don't know which ones I should start with, there's so many. Um, okay, so the first thing I wrote down is just acknowledging Senior Planner Johnson's work and the huge effort that this has taken on. We've been talking about this for a long time. So I want to just acknowledge that this is great work and thank you. All right. Um, I also, uh, on that topic, just want to make sure that I acknowledge that this is one of the projects that I have been most impressed with by the outreach. We've had other projects come to us as a commission that we've always been like, we could have done a better job. And I don't feel that way with this um, ordinance in front of us. I feel like we've done a excellent job of reaching out to property owners, to other cities, to residents. We've talked about it in the, in the commission meetings. So I just feel like we've done all of the homework we needed to do here. Um, a few things. Um, I, okay, on the square footage topic, I'm actually okay with the signage as proposed and the reason I look at that as being okay is if a larger sign is needed there are venues to get approval for that larger sign so there's signage plans for planned developments there are um, you know conditional use acceptances there within our process um, there's variance opportunities there. So I look at that as being an okay venue for a sign that is that large and for that purpose. And to Commissioner Albrecht's comment, I think a small business or a local business isn't going to be needing a sign that large 
to promote themselves. Does that make sense? Like, if I'm opening up a business for myself as a small local company, it's probably going to be a smaller scale than 250 square feet, just because 250 square feet is huge. Um, so I'm okay with that max size, size, knowing that there are other venues to make accommodations. Um, the other thing that I have written down is, and I bring this up every time, is mixed sign types. And I understand the reasoning that we're getting rid of the re requirement to have the same sign type on our commercial strip malls, for lack of a better name. But I also... When I drive by the one that we have in town that has mixed sign types, it looks cluttered. It looks janky. It doesn't have that polished look. Um, that said, I would recommend that the, I believe the Port Authority has a project in their purview, in their work plan, that is addressing um, commercial node viability and um, project to lift those commercial nodes up. And I would ask staff within the Port Authority to look at signage as a, a part of that package. Um, because I think that could raise the op appeal and the vibrancy of those commercial nodes. And maybe it can bridge the gap between this mixed use or mixed type of signage. I don't know what that would look like, but maybe that would help appease my janky, clunky looking of that one that does exist. Um, the last thing that I had written down, actually two more, I'm sorry, I'm getting long-winded. Um, I understand council's comments about the electronic billboards. Um, and I guess I, at first was, I, I wrote a, a frowny face on my paper. Um, I wasn't super keen on that um, at first as we talked through it. I think I've been swayed to be okay with it. Um, I like the 10 minutes as a first step. Right now we have, a, for all intents and purposes, a moratorium. We're now going to open up the door a crack to see um, if this happens. And then if in a year from now, we, we do a reanalysis and say, you know, we, we, we're not getting any conversion because no one can make the business case that the 10 minutes doesn't get the ROI to build the billboard, maybe that would be justification to bring it down. Um, that's a question I guess I'd have for the signage um, teams is what is the ROI for building a new sign, getting the revenue from that sign, and how often it needs to turn over, you know? from a dollars and cents perspective, 10 minutes might not be enough turnover to pay for the signage itself. So are we still restricting it because we can't get the revenue from it fast enough? Um, the other thing about billboards that somewhat bother me is we talk about signage in front of housing or residences. Um, one of our billboards that we have in, well, no, that one's in Richfield. Never mind, I'll take that back. Um, the last thing I would say is around temporary signs. Um, so I, I do think that some flexibility on temporary signs is prudent. I like the removal of the occurrence, um, mainly because um, a lot of our commercial, um, or our neighborhood commercial nodes, they're going through uh, facelifts of their facade. And when they do that, they have to take all the signs off. And they put up temporary signs as they put on new you know, siding or new brickwork or whatever they're doing the facade on. And, and there has to be some flexibility. Obviously, they're doing it to enhance their property, improve the commercial node. And that temporary sign is just that. It's temporary until they make it look great again. So those are my comments for now. Thank you, Commissioner Goldsman. Um, I'll go with some comments here as well. In regards to the electric billboards, I must say I'm just not a huge fan of them. It's not, they're not only seen when you're driving, 
some of us can see them from their house every night when they go to bed. And it switches in our, one of our neighboring cities every eight seconds. And I must say it's annoying. It doesn't stop me from sleeping, but I notice it. We all have a lot of hotels that are very that are quite vertical in the city, and our hotel guests are seeing these billboards change. And I think that's a it's just not as good of an experience as it could be. And so I'm not super inclined to loosen up regulations that allow for our four billboards in Bloomington to be converted to electronic. In fact, I'm a little disappointed of the change that we've seen since the last time we saw this. I was happy that we weren't going to have more or any electric billboards in Bloomington, and that has changed, and it may prevent me from supporting this tonight. I'm not sure yet, but it might. I, I'm not a fan of that. And, um, well, that's enough of that. Um, the next thing is the, um, the dwell time of those. I, I'm, I'm in favor of the longer dwell time, basically for the same thing I just said. People are trying to sleep at night, and you can see these, and I think a longer dwell time is prudent. And I must say, I also drive past them every morning. I take the highway to work, and I have to say, it is distracting when it changes. And I can appreciate there's been scientific studies done and whatever, but when it changes, I look at it. And I'm in, the I'm in the view of one of these electronic billboards for longer than eight seconds. Every morning when I drive it, it changes at least once. And it does take my eyes off the road. I've never driven off the road because of it, but it, it does catch my eye, I, I must say. Um, and so I'm in favor of a longer dwell time. At a very minimum, at least a dwell time where it's not going, where it's less likely to change, where it's not guaranteed to change while you're in front of it. You know, if, if you're driving 60 miles an hour, you're always going to be in front of a billboard for a certain amount of time, and I wish it was longer at least than that. So it's, it's not going to change every time you drive past it. But I don't know. I'm fine with staff's proposal of a longer dwell time there, uh, mostly for our hotel and some of our residential um, residents and guests. Regarding the promotion signs, um, I'm, I like staff's recommendation on this one. Um, I used to take the bus every day to work, and I had a bus stop that was on 494 in the city of Richfield that I would stand and wait for the bus and look back to the city of Bloomington. And I remember one of the longest going out of business sales I can ever remember, and that temp sign being there forever. And it was just, it, it became a bit of a visual nuisance, in my opinion. And the fact that this was five years ago, and I still remember that very yellow and black sign, it made an impact on me. And I, I'm not really in favor of loosening it up. I appreciate we, we don't want to hamper business and uh, all of those things. I, but I think staff has reached a fine compromise of certainly we'll allow them. Um, but I, I, I'm not in favor of 180 days. I think that's too long for a, a banner. I, I don't think that's a banner anymore. And frankly, banners aren't the, the, the quality of a normal sign. So after 180 days, they probably start looking a little tattered and, and everything else. And... We're hoping they take them down after 180 days, but maybe it turns into 250, and that sign's getting even a little more battered and faded, and I'm just not in favor of it. I like what staff has proposed here. So whether or not I'm in favor of this application, I'm not, I'm not totally sure. Commissioner Curry. Thank you, Chair. Uh, all very valid and great points by everybody here, I think. I my mind has actually like changed twice in the last two minutes. <laughs> so uh, originally I thought it would be smart to actually have a shorter dwell time because that might make billboard signage more accessible to smaller businesses. But, you know, in recognition of all the hotels in the city and my concern about residents uh, being annoyed by electronic signage, I think we probably, I support the current 10 minute time limit that we've got. I mean, I was thinking five or three minutes potentially because you're going to drive by a, a billboard quicker than that. Um, let's see. In terms of the uh, temporary signage, um, I think it's a valid point that you just don't want the signs to stay up for an extended period of time. I apologize. I don't know the code well enough to understand as to whether this, you know, the tenant days how that affects the length of time that a sign can be put up, but maybe there should be some consideration put into how long the sign can be left up for. I mean, I do, I think it's important to recognize that, uh, you know, most businesses do not survive one year, right? So in terms of retail, 
the first 60 days or whatever it is are super important. So I certainly don't want our city code to limit the ability for a small business to be able to have any signage. So I, I don't know if there's a way to strike a balance there. Maybe we already have, but I guess based on what I'm hearing, I don't know if we have. I don't, I'm not confident. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is I guess I'm still concerned about electronic signage facing residential in more residential neighborhoods um, within the city. So I think I don't think I'm going to support passing this tonight. I think there are some things that could be looked at a little bit further, and um, I just like to understand it better before feeling comfortable with what we're looking at. Commissioner Goldsman. One, excuse me, one question that I have. Um, is this presentation going to council as a full presentation, or will it, what is the plan on that? Uh, this will be at the city council on February 26th in a normal manner. Uh, will you be giving the same presentation, Mr. Johnson? Yeah, uh, Chair uh, Commissioner Goldsman. So uh, I would likely, uh, given the city council agenda environment, probably pare a few things down, but I mean, I'll follow the direction and discussion anywhere they want to uh, take it. Uh, one point I would make for your consideration tonight um, is that staff certainly can make amendments to the draft. That's one as one of your duties uh, at the advisory uh, board. If there are issues that you specifically want to change in this document, you can do so via motion. And that's the draft that gets presented to city council. Now staff can certainly provide analysis as to what informed our previous draft. But I just want to emphasize to you, it's not a take it or leave it proposition. Mm -hmm. No ordinance ever is. Uh, that doesn't mean that we can't uh, pause or come back if you want us to study a particular matter. But what I would say is that if you can, please uh, provide staff very clear direction on what needs additional analysis if that's the route uh, that you want to go. Um, so, yeah, I just want to emphasize that um, if there are... Uh, matters of discussion that, uh, you know, warrant, uh, you know, side motions or specific, and I don't, I don't want to direct you on how to uh, conduct your meeting, uh, but I just wanted to make the point uh, that staff is uh, um, ready and uh, able to present the draft ordinance that you um, uh, put forth. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. One other item I'll note, which I forgot to mention the last time, the, you know, we had a lot of... Um, public correspondence, uh, which we do appreciate, and we've, I think, all read through it, and Mr. Johnson did a nice job summarizing it. Generally speaking, I, I, I preferred staff's recommendation over all of them, with the exception of the um, request from Walls or Toyota that was um, basically increasing the number of allowable signs but keeping the square footage allowance. I found that to be a reasonable request as they had proposed it. The rest of them... Um, as I mentioned earlier, I, I, I preferred staff's recommendation over what was recommended to us. So I think where we're at here, there is a draft ordinance in front of us and a recommended motion. And I think what we could do, but I'll leave it to you all, is we could vote on the <clears throat> draft as it's been proposed to us, either a thumbs up or a thumbs down. If it's a thumbs up, that recommendation goes on to city council. If it's a thumb down, we could have additional discussion. Is there something we could um, majorly agree upon that we would rather see? Um, and we could take a vote on a, an amended um, draft ordinance. So is there any further discussion or we could uh, look for a motion? Commissioner Albrecht. Uh, thank you, Chair. The only thing that I keep going back to is goal number two of this whole process, which is to increase clarity and to decrease complexity. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I too am not a huge fan of digital billboards. I am also very distracted while driving across um, the river. Uh, <laughs> the digital billboard um, changing. However, I do want to make Bloomington a less complex place to do business. So whatever that is, whatever that means, um, some sort of similar standard to other communities. Um, and I, Mr. Johnson, would you pull up the 
slide with the other communities on the This is this looks to me like a mess. I'm trying to understand what where if you're on the north side of 494, the south side of 494, the east side, it would be very difficult to understand <laughs> what you can do where. Um, and so my perspective is if that is industry standard, that eight seconds, um, then that's something that I think I'm comfortable with as long as we get to review it in a year. Um, rather than going to 10 minutes, which I don't see anywhere on here as an example, which is fine. We can do our own thing, absolutely. However, that doesn't necessarily decrease complexity. Um, huh. I'm also, I, thank you, uh, Commissioner Goldsman, for pointing out that there is a sign variance process um, that the complexity part is where I get hung up because um, I want Bloomington to, be, Bloomington to be a place where it's easier to do to get things done and uh, having to go through that variance process, mm -hmm. though minimal and potentially a staff okay. Um, <clears throat> I just am hesitant. To, it doesn't meet the goal of less complex for people looking to build and do business here. Um, I am supportive of the um, the staff recommendation around temporary signage. So I personally would <coughs> not support the amendment as proposed, but would <coughs> cement would um, would support changes based on what we've talked about tonight. Chair Cookton, uh, Commissioner yes. Albright, can Mr. I Johnson. clarify what the, exactly that last <coughs> point was? Are you talking about the option B that I showed on a slide? Yes. Okay. I just want to make sure I'm clearly understanding you. Commissioner Albrecht. Goldsman. I'm sorry, Commissioner Goldsman. <laughs> No worries. Um, so I like how you brought us back to the beginning, right? What are our goals? And I love the complexity piece that are we, are we creating complexity? Because we, as a commission, can do that all night long if we wanted to. Um, the thing about the billboards, and that's for me right now is the, the, the big hang up. <coughs> Excuse me. I, I don't think... I can get to the eight seconds, though I don't think 20 minutes is feasible, looking at Edina or Savage, um, or yeah, Eden Prairie. So to get it to be less complex, I would actually be in more favor, it'd be more, it'd be more favorable to just not allowing electronic billboards it keeps it simple. Then we don't have to fight about how often they can refresh. Then again, in a year, we can actually have the ROI conversation with the numbers of what makes financial sense to bring these in. You know, if, if it's 10 minutes and that justifies building an electronic, I don't know. I just struggle with, if we put it at 10 minutes, it might not even make, financial sense to build. So it's like we're putting a moratorium on it, even though we're not. We're saying, yeah, you can, you can have it, but does it really make sense? So I think it needs more study. We need more time to, to dig into that one further. The other thing, too, is there's only four of them. So are we made, making a mountain out of a molehill? I don't know. But those are my two couple of comments. Commissioner Albert. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Commissioner Goldsman <coughs> makes a good point. Um, you know, I think I go back to our 
self-storage conversation that we had <laughs> um, where if we narrow the the um, lane so much that it's impossible to actually do anything um, or actually move forward, then what's the point? Um, <clears throat> and I, I, I kind of, I, there is a reason why billboards are not allowed to be built in the city of Bloomington um, and why we have four legally non-conforming because we don't want any additional billboards but yet we're discussing having electronic billboards, mm -hmm. um, which to me are a bigger nuisance than a freestanding billboard. So I, I kind of agree with that. I think I would be in favor of eliminating the ability to do a digital conversion. Let me ask a question of the two of you. Um, you know, I, I do agree with you that data-driven decisions are, are good ones for us to make. We do well with, with data-driven decisions. If we were to, let's just the, hypothetically say, hold this over till our next meeting to get that data, perhaps that's something Mr. Johnson could work with um, to get us that data, would you be in a better position to make a decision? Or I'm also hearing you're potentially in favor of not allowing them to begin with. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Maybe I'll start with Mr. Johnson. Is that the type of information you could provide in a couple of weeks, or is that not reasonable? Yeah, Chair, I guess uh, one thing uh, I would indicate uh, with respect to that question is that there is a lot of materials out there uh, on this topic, um, and there's even some, and helpfully so, there's even some uh, academic papers that summarize a lot of studies uh, about um, electronic sign dwell times and kind of the impacts they can have on driver distraction and some of those things. Uh, my general takeaways uh, from those things is that that community of doing that research has not landed on any one individual standard for what is deemed a safe um, uh, standard of dwell time for drivers. What they will tell you is that shorter messages are safer than longer messages, that uh, graphics under themselves can be more distracting than uh, shorter messages. So more complex messages are less safe than uh, less complex <coughs> messages. But they won't land on, I understand that the Federal Highway Administration issued this uh, order in the early 2000s around the eight seconds. I, I recognize and uh, respect that, but I think you will not find uniformity of the, the traffic safety community that think that that is a safe standard or that um, uh, would propose that for a local jurisdiction. So um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not opposed or I'm, I'm certainly willing to collect some of this uh, research for you and transmit it to you and present it in a public setting. We certainly can do that. Uh, but what we've attempted and what I'm trying to communicate now is that uh, I don't think uh, you'll feel fulfilled by, as I have not found fulfilled by uh, doing this investigation myself in the past. Um, we certainly have engineering and traffic staff here if you want to talk to them, but I, I've, what I've uh, attempted to communicate to, to them does reflect a lot of conversations that we've had over this time. And I know uh, their position is that mo uh, longer dwell times uh, are safe uh, or are better than shorter dwell times. Commissioner Curry. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I would also just support just skipping electronic billboards in general. I mean, otherwise, you could just go back and forth on times forever. And I don't know, I guess I just don't see the benefit. So, other than the small business thing that I mentioned about five minutes ago, but <laughs> yeah, I think we just skip it. Commissioner Goldsman. So, if I can just surmise that based on what I'm, I'm hearing, that the commission would recommend to city council to adopt the ordinance, removing the billboard, electronic billboard allowance, and then adding temporary sign allowances um, as proposed in option B. Is that? I think that is an optional motion you could make. I will speak for myself and that I don't think I could support the second half of that amendment, but that's just where I'm at. Commissioner Albert. Uh, Mr. Chair, is there a way where you would feel comfortable around temporary signage allowances as, as, 
as origin option A is comfortable for you? Uh, Mr. Johnson, what is option A again? Forgive me. Let me uh, pull no, it up. Forgive me for for that. It's okay. Hopefully this isn't too uh, brain damaging. <laughs> Oops, I went the wrong way. Here we go. <coughs> well, he's that. doing that, I do have one comment, if Please. that's all right. Yes. So when I think billboards, and no offense to the Clear Channel folks who are here, um, when I think billboards, I think drive-through communities. And I don't want Bloomington to be a drive-through community. And I think that that's why it just just bugs me because I know that the corridor 494 where the billboards are tends to be a place where people drive through and I know we're going to do some there are changes being made to 494 to have that even more so um, and so I just I'm sensitive to the fact that I don't want to see Bloomington as a drive through community and having billboards leads me to believe that I mean when I think billboards, I think driving up to Duluth and looking at all the billboards as you drive up there. Um, and so, therefore, I just am I'm okay with letting them live the way that they live, um, but not encouraging change to them. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Cookton. Uh, um, so the, the existing sign ordinance draft has three uh, categories um, uh, based on the number of tenants. It's one single tenant, two tenants to 19 tenants, and 20 or more tenants. Um, and so the day limitation of those three categories, respectively, is 60 days, 90 days, or 120 days. Uh, to the comment I heard earlier about the same business being up for that extended period of time, the language both in that this draft and in option B actually has a 60-day limitation for each individual tenant. Um, and I would again highlight the point about if you have multiple tenants that both have signs up on the same day, that counts as one day, not multiple days. Just, again, reiterating that point. And can you help, uh, I'm sure you said it earlier, but can you help explain the just uh, the justification reasoning why a multi-tenant building we think is uh, more appropriate for more calendar days than a, a smaller strip center? Yeah, so Chair Cookton, as the uh, person from Krauss, provided testimony, testimony to just with a greater number of uh, businesses, they're going to be... Uh, uh, a greater number wherever you feel comfortable that range is it is sensical or rational that uh, they're going to have a greater uh, demand for temporary signage based on special sale events or grand openings or uh, other commercial activities uh, so a, a 10 tenant building versus a two tenant building is just going to have a greater demand for that okay. signage type so this is per building correct so in the case of just say South Town, I think there's like three or four buildings there. Those are separate buildings. Uh, that's incorrect. Let me take that. So it would be based on a site, uh, site basis. Yeah. Okay. So we would we would capture the amount of tenants uh, on an individual uh, site or property or uh, in some cases plan development. But um, I would say that there's not many. Um, uh, you know, I think why staff pr presented this option B to you tonight is that um, uh, we felt that the expansion of the allowance only was applicable to uh, a limited number of properties in Bloomington on the basis that not that many sites have that many tenants. So that's why we were comfortable presenting that as an alternative. Could we see plan B again? Yes. And forgive me for it's okay. perhaps misunderstanding this a little bit. Okay, well, I do like the language of no individual tenant exceeding 60 days per calendar year. That makes me feel significantly more comfortable. I apologize. I missed that the first time. 180 days per year. So half the year. Half the year. It's 30 or more. 20. It's close enough within my range where I don't think it, it would prevent me from supporting it. To answer your question, Commissioner Albrecht. So thank you, Mr. Johnson, for that clarification. Commissioner Curry. 
so um, in terms of, you know, if we skip the billboard, I'm supportive of this plan B for the temporary signs. I could be supportive of the whole project or the whole proposal, I suppose, if I had a better understanding of just this uh, electronic signage that faces residential because they really don't want, I mean, once the sign's installed, then it doesn't matter what we do a year from now. Somebody who lives across the street, it's like, hey, you cost me $10,000 in property value, and I'm really annoyed living in Bloomington now. So I really don't want people, you know, coming back to us and saying, what, what are you guys doing? So I don't know if there's a way to be more comfortable about that tonight, but I'm still concerned about that. Commissioner Goldsman. Thank you. Um, Steph, do you have a map of where the four billboards are today? Uh, yeah, I... I um you know what? I don't have that in my current slide deck, uh, but one is on 35W, um, close to 490. Or, uh, no, forgive me. I'm more on the south side. There is one on the northwest in 494. There's one just to the west of Portland on 494, and uh, there is one close to uh, 494 on 35W. Um, Matthew could t probably tell me better than I could. Am I close? Yes. Okay, yeah. There's two on 35W, effectively, and two on 494 at kind of one on the east side, one on the west side. You want that repeated, Commissioner Goldsman? Just for clarification, the one on the east side mm -hmm. that is abutting to Seven Hills, is that in Richfield or is that in Bloomington? Seven Hills. Prep Academy. It's an old yeah. Minnesota business. Yeah. Chair Commissioner, Mark Mark. Commissioner Goldsman, that, that one is in Ridgefield. That one, uh, okay. Thank you for the lifeline. Thank you. And I, I, with respect to Commissioner Curry's question, um, so facing residential, I mean, frankly, that's going to come up in other electronic sign types much more so than billboards. So, I mean, I, I know that there's been a lot of discussion about billboards, but the nighttime issue and the nighttime restriction about static or, you know, I said, mentioned some cities require you to turn them off at night. That's more applicable. Uh, it's within 150 feet of a residential property. So not many billboards. I, mean, I don't think any of those billboards are within 150 feet. They might be visible from a farther distance away. Um, but uh, um, with respect to the kind of interventions or the tweaks that you can make to it, I mean, you certainly could look at extinguishing them. Um, right now, we have, in effect, the existing code has an orientation standard, which, in effect, serves as an additional setback at 150 feet. And so that's why that um, uh, number, uh, we're trying to capture what the value of what that number was before, but put some restrictions, some breaks on it, if you will, uh, by requiring that it can't change during the evening time. And we do have brightness restrictions, as I mentioned. Um, so... Um, you know, potential interventions are just to make the buffer 150 feet because we have a 100-foot buffer in the proposal. Or you could say they have to be turned off at the evening time. That comes with the downside of additional staff code enforcement activities and those things. Um, but, you know, could, uh, you know, offer potential um, uh, uh, assurance or um, intervene in bad situations. Um, but, uh, you know... The, Part of this discussion and the complexity of all these topics is why we're recommending the year look back on some of this stuff because these operational things can be changed. Um, you're going to have some property owners who might be upset um, about some of these things if you go in one direction or the other. Um, but, you know, these operational things, once the sign is in, uh, in the ground, as you said, Commissioner Curry, doesn't mean that the operation of it can't uh, change subject to a new city standard. So just something to think about. Any further discussion? If not, Mr. Johnson, I'd ask you to turn to that recommended motion so we can start to digest how to move forward here. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I, I'm not trying to drive the conversation, but with respect to, I wrote down six uh, kind of issues that were questions during your discussion. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you, there was some discussion about whether or not to recommend the conversion of uh, digital billboards and if the commission wants to go in that direction, that's your purview. But I just want to be specific about which uh, specific provision within the draft ordinance you would strike or change. 
And the reason I say that is that we added that provision in nonconformity and in the uh, billboard section. It's an exception to allow the conversion. So um, that's most likely what you'd be striking, and I just want to be clear about that. Because the existing billboard standards has a dwell time. None of them are electronic currently, um, but if you don't want to see that conversion and then these are legally nonconforming, that's that nonconformity provision that you would not support. I just want to be clear about that. But I'll go to the recommendation slide. Something we've done in the past, in the past commissioners, is made a series of motions. Mm -hmm. One thing we've done in the past is that we would um, move to not recommend adoption, and then make a subsequent motion of something we would prefer. As chair, I can't make a motion, so that's at your purview of how you want to handle this. I see uh, City Attorney, Assistant City Attorney Koski has stepped to the dais, uh, checking in with you if you have any thoughts before we proceed here. No, I was <coughs> chair and commissioners. I was just looking at the um, the section that allows digital conversion of billboards just so we had a right citation for you for your motion. Um, so that is uh, 21.304.20. Subsection E. So that would be uh, the, the section at issue. Can we get that number one more time? Sure. 21.304.20 E. Parens E. So, like Mr. Johnson was saying, just so you were certain on what needs to be taken out before it goes to City Council, if that's your intent. Mr. Albert. Uh, thank you, Chair. Could I make a motion striking that subsection and uh, amending the language to option, we can call it option B? Could I, do you want to start with that? Mm -hmm. Do you want to start with <laughs> The temporary. Uh, the, yes. To... to Balance with what I was saying earlier is perhaps by making multiple motions, there's a greater impact to city council that we do not approve as it's been proposed in offering a um, option. But that's really semantics. So, however, you'd like to craft that motion is at your discretion. Com Chair, commissioners, I might just suggest. Uh, a motion similar to what Mr. Johnson has in, in the staff report, just stating with the following amendments or something. So you have one motion to for a recommendation with your caveats then in the motion too. So you just have one, one motion and then uh, it says what alterations we want. Mr. Marker. Chair Cookton, <clears throat> one approach that commissions used in the past a fair amount is to have some kind of discussion before the motion on each individual issue with some kind of straw polling of where people are at to see uh, which issues the majority would support and then potentially including that in a motion of support with the following amendments. Something to consider. Uh, Mr. Johnson, if we were to go with that approach, I'd ask for your help on on the particular issues that are of interest to council that we have. I got a list. Go okay. Uh, I'll ask the commission, is that a route you'd like to take here is to walk through them one by one and do some perhaps informal straw polling? Seeing some nodding of heads. Mr. Johnson, please uh, walk us through that list. The first one was, thank you, Chair, the first one was electronic billboard conversion. So I think we, well. I, I think what we'll do is we'll just go down the line here. I would say uh, no. 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 Nope. The second one was electronic sign dwell time, the, the actual standard itself, the and duration. I'm going to say I support staff's recommendation. Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay. The electronic sign nighttime restriction went within 150 feet, between 101 feet and 150 feet of residential uses. Can you explain that one a little more? Yeah, so the if a sign, if an electronic sign was located... Um, outside of the residential buffer requirement, which is 100 feet, but within 150 feet, uh, operation of that sign would be limited to static 
display, meaning it can't change. It can no longer change after that time, and nighttime is being 9 p.m. to 7 a.m., uh, or be turned off. So that gives the sign op owner operator two choices to make, operationally speaking. Okay. I'm going to say I have no opinion. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yes. Yes. I, yeah, support the restriction. Okay, the um, next one was parking structure signs. Walzer Toyota submitted a letter about um, uh, increasing the number of building signs. Currently, the draft has a limitation of one individual sign, and a number of one, um, and 150 square foot cap. And their proposal is to keep the square footage cap but allow multiple signs. Correct, two signs on an elevation facing a public street. I'm in favor of that one. I'm indifferent. Good. I'm also indifferent. I'm sorry. I was thinking about the residential. <laughs> <laughs> so currently, uh, it, where building signs are allowed on parking structures in Bloomington, uh, they're only allowed in a few one or two sign districts, I think. And so, and again, trying to create more continuity or less complexity, we're saying they're allowed on parking structures three stories or taller, but you're limited to one sign per elevation facing a street up to 150 square feet. Walzer Toyota uh, supports that general proposal, but would like the opportunity to have two building signs uh, on that elevation, not changing the total square footage allowed, but just the number of them. Uh, no. From one to two? I, no. I, I, what's the staff recommendation? Is a single sign? It's a single sign, but uh, I guess as noted in the staff report, this is not one that breaks our back, so to speak. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that's okay. Yep. <laughs> For clarity, uh, single I sign. Support that. So yes, I support the Walzer recommendation. Sure. Thank you. Okay. The commercial promotions option B uh, discussion. Temporary signs. Eileen, yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. And then the last discuss. There was discussion around the individual maximum building sign size of two hundred, which is two hundred fifty square feet in the. Class 3 sign district and 150 square feet in the Class 5 sign district. And uh, we didn't have a lot of staff response on that one here during the meeting, but uh, just from a perspective, keep in mind the aspects around nonconformity. Yes, you can seek variances um, to an individual uh, to that standard. Uh, however, and I'm not trying to confuse the matters, but currently the PD, uh, the tools in the PD would not allow flexibility to that. So if you wanted to create a pathway to have PD flexibility to that standard, we would need to amend the, the plan development overlay allowances, which uh, if that's your kind of legislative direction, I know how I would do that, and I would be able to capture that uh, spirit. Um, but it just where where should the cap be for a maximum individual sign? And then the other thing I would say too is that um, uh, obviously you're allowed to have uh, as many signs as you want on a wall that fills in your overall square footage allowance. I know that this has been a little bit confusing in the past, so forgive me. Uh, but what the 250 square feet is, it's an individual sign. It's not that you only get 250 square feet on an elevation. You can have 10 signs on an elevation of various sizes. What this is saying is that uh, it's creating a cap of the individual signs. Okay, thank you. Um, I support the recommendation in the staff report. I do as well. Yes, I do as well. Yep, me too. Okay, thank you all. And that, that, was, that was the six items that I wrote down. Okay, so based on what you've written down there, uh, which ones would, would be needed to make a motion based on what we just told you? I look to Attorney Katoski to fill in my blanks, but I think the motion you would make is um, I move to recommend approval um, subject to the amendments as agreed upon uh, as part of planning commission discussion and uh, outlined in these six items. Can we keep it that general, or do we need to list? Do you want to list just the ones that change? Yeah, those two. I think so. So option, forgive me, uh, temporary signs, option B changed, and uh, the parking structure sign change from one to two, uh, and the digital conversion. Those are the three amendments okay, so that don't the, follow the staff recommendation. Okay, the ones that don't follow the staff recommendation are not converting to digital signs, the Walzer Toyota of uh, allowing two instead of one, and the option B for the uh, promotional temporary signage. As shown on the staff slide. As shown in what we're calling uh, number letter B. Which will be as part of the official record. <laughs> 
Uh, are my fellow commissioners clear on, on all of that? You want to do it? Go for it. Well, I'll do my best. Commissioner uh, Goldsman. Thank you, Chair. In case PL 2023-205, I mo move to recommend adoption of an ordinance establishing new standards and procedures for signs, thereby amending chapters 1, 2, 12, 14, 17, 19, and 21, and Appendix A of the City Code with the amendments of striking the conversion of existing digital boards 21.304.20E, um, changing the parking structure sign requirements from one to two, and implementing a temporary sign B plan in the table from the staff report. Do we have a second? Good. Second. Any further discussion or clarification? All those in favor of the motion as proposed to say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion passes 4-0. This will move on to City Council February 26th as a public hearing item. A special thank you to Mr. Toski, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Markovar for helping us through that one. That was complicated, um, but we, we did a, well, a fine job. So thank you to the three of you. Thank you. Item number three is a study item. The applicant is the city of Bloomington uh, regarding environmental standards review. Michelle Lincoln is our planner on this one. Uh, Ms. Lincoln, is this the first time you've presented before us? Uh, Chair and Commission, no, I have presented the annual housing report That's information. Right. Okay. Well, we're happy to have you back. Thank you. And uh, please continue forward. Sorry, just one moment while I prepare. <clears throat> Uh, Commissioner Albrecht. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Commissioner Curry went to use the restroom. I was wondering if we could just do two second, two minute break for a restroom break. I think we'll do a five minute uh, recess, um, <laughs> and we'll, we we will restart at eight twenty seven. Okay. Thank you.
Okay, we're back. Ms. Lincoln, please proceed. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Chair and Commission. I am excited to uh, share with you um, the work and research that I've done in order to present some options and for this environmental standards review for low density residential. So there's a, um, as you might have seen in the report, it's rather large. There's a lot of information, and I'm going to structure this presentation a little bit different than the how the report is structured. Um, so I'll take you through background and methodology briefly, so you can kind of get the lay of the land of where my reasoning was and the resources that I uh, consulted. And then I'm going to go through each of the, the natural features that I reviewed, both as the background and analysis and policy uh, actions all together. Um, and then I will pause for questions and um, so that way you have opportunities to ask for clarification um, because I did choose to be as concise as I can while providing relevant details in order for you to have discussion. But I wanna make sure that uh, your questions are answered uh, throughout the process. So there will be opportunities through these features where I will pause um, so that way you can ask those questions um, and then after we've kind of reviewed each of the environmental features, we'll do a summary uh, where I will kind of go over what the staff recommendation was, make notes of any recommendations that you have that might differ from staff recommendations, um, and then document those um, so that way they can be in the staff report for Planning Commission. Uh, this is going to Planning Commission on currently on February 12th, um, so I wanna make sure I capture all of your discussion in that addition to my report. And then there'll be time for additional questions and discussion if there's other things you wanna cover that I didn't specifically cover in these items. So that's kind of the, the roadmap for my presentation. Um, so with background and me uh, methodology, the, this project developed from considerations from the single and two family amendments that were adopted in May 2023. Um, council had recommended that planning, uh, planning staff pursue research in order to understand environmental standards and uh, low density residential and how they intersect um, and what are possible actions we could take to, to make sure we have a balance between protecting our precious environmental features, but also making sure that we are responding to the housing need in Bloomington, which is critical, as you heard from me from the annual housing report last year. Um, also, uh, the original project plan included a review of native landscaping. That is actually a project that is being led by Public Works and the Sustainability Commission. They are handling um, kind of pulling together a native landscaping, a native and managed landscaping ordinance, um, and that's in progress. Um, there's always opportunities for me to collaborate with that group based on discussion here today, but I won't be covering what they're covering currently. You'll hear about that project more at a later date. So the environmental standards review covers trees, slopes, and wildlife and habitat. Um, uh, and those are the three items that I will be covering through the rest of the presentation. So for my methodology, when I conducted this, I first started with um, consulting ecological resources and research. I really wanted to understand the actual ecosystem elements and what they're susceptible and vulnerable to just by existing as environmental features. Um, so I dug deep into the science of those things um, and then started layering in the complexity when we talk about uh, the human impact and uh, on those vulnerabilities and susceptibility, as well as land use and then land use policy. Uh, so there's kind of a lot of layers going there, and I layered that in on top of what is a slope, what is a tree canopy, those types of things. I also conducted a review where I compared 10 Minnesota city codes um, across these three features, uh, really focusing on those kind of like foundational uh, characteristics of those environmental features and how they intersect with policy. Just to understand where Bloomington is in comparison to similar cities or cities who are in close proximity. I collaborated with in relevant internal staff, which included public works, which is city forestry, engineering, uh, stormwater, legal, to make sure that I was really understanding how our standards or these types of standards interacted with other chapters that planning may not have an influence in but could learn from or may need to work with in the future in order to make changes. 
Public engagement was done through our Let's Talk Bloomington page, um, where I describe environmental features and kind of our goals and protecting them as well as balancing that with housing need um, and infill development. We had one comment um, that was just kind of, you know, like, I'm glad that you're doing this. I really love vegetation in uh, managing soil erosion. And um, I love it too. So <laughs> that's documented in the staff report. Um, and you'll hear a little bit more about where those uh, vegetation comes in for environmental features and protection. And then I also performed some Bloomington specific analysis and mapping. Um, so really looking at the Bloomington code for itself and how it interacts with environmental features. So in determining um, the interventions for the protection of environmental features, um, I kind of looked at everything that we do already that reviews environmental standards um, and gives us discretion or authority to protect environmental features. I've listed them here in three different categories um, and uh, some of them might overlap you know, a little bit uh, that might have more than one. One's a review, but it's also a policy document, but it's also law. Um, but I just kind of generally um, put these in categories for easy reading. Um, and through this, through these general categories, there's 18 interventions, and these are just categories. So even there's even more interventions that we do um, in order to make sure that we are paying attention to our environmental features through low density um, residential development. So this is a kind of a simple table for the area uh, city code review. So these are the other cities that I looked at. Um, the tree preservation, all cities I looked at had some sort of general tree preservation for low density residential. Um, some of that, those things kind of varied um, in, based on the city's discretion to vary kind of, like there's a range that is um, acceptable um, for slopes and protections. Um, Bloomington is the only one listed here. I wanna be clear that other cities all have soil erosion um, and sedimentation control policies. Bloomington was the only one that had actual steep slopes ordinance. Um, so we specifically identify steep slopes in our, or in, in our code while other cities didn't do that. They still had slopes protections, but it might be more spread out um, or um, not maybe as clear or direct as what Bloomington has um, in our code. And then for wildlife and habitat, St. Paul very specifically has a district called RL, and that is um, actually has the, as listed in the purpose, wildlife um, and habitat um, preservation or maintenance. Um, whereas Bloomington and Burnsville, we have non-residential conservation districts. So residential is not allowed in our conservation district um, zoning. It is not very common even nationally to have um, wildlife and habitat ordinances. So we're not necessarily out of sync with trend, although that could be changing, um, but there's not necessarily a lot of data currently locally on, on what that would look like might be forging a new path if we decide to go that way. So we're gonna look at trees. <laughs> um, so typical standards cover um, four major things. Protection of existing trees, uh, replacements of trees that have been removed, removal activities and when and how many um, trees can be removed, and prohibited species. So what can be planted um, it, within the city um, limits. Also tree surveys, preservation plans, landscaping plans, ensure that trees are accounted for during plat or development processes. So it's not necessarily only during plat su or subdivision. Um, we also have things in place for development processes where we are paying attention to you know, where trees um, are located on a property. So our current tree preservation standards, um, so Bloomington has some of the more extensive tree preservation standards compared to the other cities. We have a tree preservation um, uh, section, so it's called out very specifically, 21301.04, I think, is, is our tree, I'm calling from memory, but it's in, it's in chapter 21. 
Um, and it covers the main activities that I mentioned, the um, prohibited species, protection, removal, um, and uh, replanting. And it also covers things like having um, thresholds for those things in single family, um, some, uh, or excuse me, in uh, low density residential, not necessarily single family, I'll go over that a little bit more. Um, and also things like specific tree species or uh, tree amounts um, and that other cities didn't necessarily get into that type of granular detail. Some did, but it's on, we're on that end with the, with the cities that did um, on more extensive there. So tree preservation standards apply to all single and two family plats or subdivisions in R1, RS1, and R1A. That means if a plat came um, uh, up for, I mean any plat, but especially like under our changes for the single and two family amendments that were made, uh, tree preservation standards would apply. Reforestation plans are required when 50% or more of total diameter breast tight inches are removed um, of significant trees. Um, and that just means that uh, diameter breast height is basically the tree around uh, at, well, I'm shorter, but <laughs> at a kind of standard <laughs> breast height. Um, and uh, so we do have thresholds uh, where uh, we start to trigger and say you have to replace some of the trees if you're removing them. And then also in tandem with some discussion about slope, if there's a significant tree on slopes of greater than 25%, which is very steep, um, but would, and would fall under steep slope standards, um, those cannot be removed without approval of the city forester. Um, so there's some kind of uh, layering there between um, protecting our slopes through s soil stabilization with trees, but also protecting our tree canopy. So some, there, there's some nice um, sinking there between some code elements. So now I'm gonna talk about policy options um, that, I, that kind of rose to the top out of everything that I reviewed. So I have four here and we're gonna go through um, each of them one by one. So our first one is text cleanup for clarity. Um, no actual resident or regulation changes. So the standards aren't changing, um, but it's making the code much easier to engage with um, by staff, residents, or anyone who is needing to go to this code for any reason. The block of text at the top is our current significant tree definition. So this actually isn't listed in our regulations. It's listed in our definitions. Definitions aren't typically the best place for regulation. So it's kind of muddying things a little bit and also making it a little bit difficult to engage with or understand exactly what your requirements would be um, for significant trees. Uh, so this recommendation um, recommends that the definition be amended to be more broad to really talk about the kind of metrics for significant trees, which is trees that are of a, uh, that are mature of a certain size of a certain amount or in an ecologically advantaged location that provides significant ecosystem benefits to the community. So it's kind of a definition of a significant tree that was developed through a variety of uh, pulling things from a variety of sources that kind of capture the spirit of what people mean with a significant tree. The table that you see here is that definition, but just put into a table. This one actually says what a significant tree is based on its category or type um, and its size. So we do get into kind of thresholds and metrics um, in, in more detail. And this table could be located actually um, in the, uh, the outside of the definitions in one of the subsections of the code for tree preservation. Is there any questions so far? Yes, uh, Commissioner, uh, Chair and Commissioner Goldsman, please. Go ahead, Commissioner Goldsman. Thank you. Um, one question that I had <clears throat> on this is, Maybe right around, it's more about the specific species of trees. Mm -hmm. So I see that we don't allow willow, box elder, aspen. Why do we not include things like ash or elm that have obviously been blighted by pests or disease? 
Was that something that Thank you. That's a uh, thank you, Chair and Commissioner Goldsmith. That's a great question. Um, so this is just in talking about significant trees. There is a prohibited trees section, eighteen point zero three, that includes a more expansive um, uh, list of trees that are not allowed. Um, it includes more trees than this. This is kind of a, talking more about what trees are considered significant and and what is. Uh, generally allowed and the reason why it's here is because if it's a significant tree the city forester may make an exception so if it's a mature stable non-diseased tree then the city forester will say that's a significant tree you're going to have to replant protect um, or otherwise make accommodations for that tree so that's why you can't plant them but you can protect them yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your question. Okay. Okay. Yay. Um, so another text cleanup for clarity um, would be uh, this. There's an ambiguity here. It says that tree protective fencing is required before any issuance of a grading or building permit. And this is within the tree preservation code, but it's pretty it's not specific enough for tree preservation because tree surveys and tree preservation plans are only listed as required for plat applications. Um, and not all, uh, uh, not all grading and building permits would be tied to a plat application. And sometimes you could do a plant application, but you may not get to the building or grading permit yet. Um, so that means the tree, if there is protecting to be done, kind of gets lost here. The suggestion would be saying, um, when tree preservation standards are triggered, tree protective fencing is required before any issuance or grading, uh, grading or building permit. That's actually how it's done in practice. So this would just have the code reflect practice and just clear up a little bit of an ambiguity there. So this a policy action has some benefits. It's improved readability for all code users. Um, there's likely no equity impacts. Uh, current equity impacts are unexplored, but you wouldn't have any new ones. So we wouldn't necessarily be um, getting into unintended consequences territory. And we would likely need no further in-depth study for these changes because it's just adding clarity. Challenges would be staff time and resources to coordinate across departments. If we're kind of doing clarity changes, we want to make sure that the self-referential nature of the code is uh, that integrity is and quality is maintained. And then aligning and then further aligning the definitions um, and refinements across relevant code chapters. So it's staff time as well as just getting into the code and making sure things are um, all making sense um, and represent the code as intended. Are there any questions about this policy action? Seeing none. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Mr. Curry, Commissioner Curry. Uh, as a study item, do we should we just provide feedback on these points as they come up? Now that we're this is a study point. item, so it's more open. And I'll ask Ms. Lincoln. Uh, should we wait until you're done with item one and then you'll ask if we support it or how would you like us to handle that? I think that um, at the end of the tree preservation section, I um, have a list of the each of the policy actions and we can go through them one by one to kind of get a temperature check on if you support it or your thoughts about it um, uh, at that point. But I will take comments at any time and I'll make notes as we go through. That sounds great. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, the uh, item to policy action two for tree preservation is a comprehensive tree preservation standards review. Um, this would be a more in-depth tree preservation review across all code. Um, review and this would review regulations for best practice updates or regulation impacts. And some things this could likely uh, impact, either change the current regulation or add them, is diameter breast height recommendations for significant trees, um, tree species. Um, uh, as mentioned, there could be um, some possible adjustments that we could have to our tree species or further qualifications, planting locations, threshold triggers for removal, 
or critical root area protections. So there's kind of a lot of things that could come up um, during an in-depth review across the code um, that could be explored and later become amendments. So the benefits of this is that a newly updated system uh, or newly updated results with amendments can mean no or minor revisions in the long term. So we're kind of updating our science and that just sets us up for uh, like the next round of science until it becomes you know, outdated. So challenges, uh, staff capacity necessary would be significant. Current standards are already robust, and in discussion with um, city forestry, um, there wasn't any major concerns that our code was out of sync with the best practices. Um, although, like some minor changes or that require study could be explored, there was nothing that would that came up during that discussion that would imply that the implementation of our current code still protects our environmental features and balances our uh, housing need. And then we could do the in-depth standards review and find that no or minimal changes may be needed. And this reasoning comes from the fact that our current standards are already quite robust. Any questions regarding policy action two? See none. Uh, policy action three is amending tree removal thresholds, rates of reforestation, and tree preservation applicability. Now these are pulled out specifically um, or separately from policy action two because these are areas that, um, typical areas that are opportunities for discretion. Cities like Burnsville have different tree removal thresholds based on the type of uh, zoning, um, the type of development, the density, um, and they, they actually get more uh, granular based on those things because there's a little bit more discretion built into this. There's a little bit of a range where you could be a little bit more restrictive or a little less restrictive um, in this removal threshold. Um, so our current removal threshold is 50% of significant tree inches. And then for our reforestation rate, we currently require 1.25 caliper inches per one inch removed. So we're requiring more tree if you remove uh, significant trees. And then also expanding applicability to all new building permits for single and two family. Currently, Tree these types of standards and tree preservation are only triggered with plat or subdivision applications. We can expand that to building permits where you might see some major structural changes on the uh, property. So the benefits of these is the decision on these thresholds have some discretion with the city. So um, uh, that gives us a lot of kind of leeway to be more or less restrictive depending on our goals. Um, and also increasing the applicability is predicted to produce less than 10 additional projects per year uh, for, uh, uh, to approve. And this is based on the current rate of uh, these types of applications. Um, five is actually the number that was quoted in the report. So I said 10 even just to be generous and give us a lot of room there, um, but that's about how much we could protect um, based on past rates of development. So the challenges here is coordination across divisions to fill resource gaps. Um, even though we have some discretion, we would still need to be uh, sound in our reasoning scientifically um, in order to avoid any kind of like, uh, uh, like complaints or uh, legal considerations where there might be uh, undue cost burden. Uh, and if we don't have sound reasoning, it just kind of weakens the policy overall. So it's good to have that data there uh, as we make these decisions based even on discretion. And also financial impacts on low density redevelop or development would need to be explored and confirmed. We're kind of dealing with an economy of scale for low density residential where for all new building permits, if they're, say, uh, adding square footage or uh, to an existing structure, ADUs, um, like if we change the thresholds at that scale, requiring more trees, 
could be a larger percentage of the development and make it unfeasible. And we don't want to slow the rate of housing, um, but we also don't want to lose our, our trees. So there's kind of um, some additional data there um, would be helpful to make sure that we are actually balancing those in a Bloomington specific context even realizing that there's a, a range of discretion represented in the compared cities. May I ask a question? Yes, of course. Thank you. Chair and commission. What's a caliper inch? Yes. Oh, um, <laughs> can I, can I call in a lifeline on what a caliper inch is for a tree? If anybody, anyone know? If anybody knows. <laughs> yes. Uh, Mr. Markergaard. Uh, Chair Cookton, uh, if you imagine measuring a tree, um, so a caliper, something like, if you can imagine what a caliper is, you would kind of measure it that way. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's it's not like uh, measurement around the tree, but it's more just the, that gets you a diameter, basically. Very well. Thank you. Thank you, Planning Manager Mark Regard. Policy option four is uh, to draft and incorporate a new tree credit system. Tree credits satisfy landscaping requirements um, through developers or property owners preserving or planting larger trees. So it's something along the lines of either we have a requirement that has a number, certain number of trees, they plant a larger tree and it counts as two. So it satisfies, satisfies the requirement even though they only planted one or they might have a significant tree um, that is quite large um, and it alone satisfies the landscaping requirement. Um, this can also be applied to other types of vegetation like shrubs, uh, shrubs, not shrubs, <laughs> um, <laughs> shrubs, and current um, requirements do not factor in the age or size of existing or proposed trees. So this would be kind of a wholly new addition to the code. In the figure here, you see Brooklyn Park's um, credit system um, that kind of shows that how they exchange um, the, tree, the tree credits to satisfy their landscaping requirements. So the benefits of this is it provides flexibility in meeting tree preservation and planting requirements, which could be important if we're um, evaluating the kind of economy of scale of low density um, low density residential development. Um, the challenges are that currently um, there's no single family development, there's no single family development landscaping requirements. Um, so those would have to be amended to include requirements for this type of system to have benefit on the full range of low density residential. And then also scientific or professional reasoning from public works or city forestry would likely need to be required. So that way we're getting the exchange rates right. And so we're actually incentivizing um, trees that do provide maximum benefit. So those were the four policy options for trees. Um, and we can go through and kind of understand um, the uh, temperature of Planning Commission for each of these options. Um, and to clarify, so one uh, and three are the staff recommendation. Chair and Commission, comments? Ms. Lincoln, are any of these dependent on the other? Like, are they, does four include three, two, and one, or could we select a la carte here? Um, thank you for the question. You can select a la carte. Mm. Okay. Um, I'll first ask if any of the commissioners have comments on any of these, if there's any discussion or anything you'd like to have. Commissioner Curry. Thank you, Chair. First, I guess I'll just mention that um, we're just in transparency review, reviewing this because of the work that uh, myself and our neighborhood did with the planning or with the uh, city council last spring. So um, I've already, I don't know, just thought that's something that should probably be mentioned. So um, in terms of these options, um, just quickly, I think, you know, the table uh, in the text cleanup is a good idea. I'm a little 
hesitant about generalizing definitions unless it's tied to a table. So there's still specific like, measurements and significant does not become like a blurry topic. Um, the tree preservation standards, yeah, I think that seems like too much work, so I'd probably just skip it. I think the, you know, amending, what was it? The re tree removal thresholds. Um, so that, I think, the, the threshold, the 50% threshold, I think is something that would be interesting to look at. Um, and maybe just specifically for, like, say, the RS1 district, which is, and I, I would guess I'd look to planning manager Mark Agar to confirm this, but I think the RS1 district is really intended to be kind of an environmentally focused district. So to have a lower tree removal threshold of 40% versus 50% would maybe be more appropriate to put into that district specifically. Is that right? Mr. Marker? <coughs> Chair <Chair> Cookton, <coughs> Commissioner Curry. That's correct. Uh, the environmental preservation um, is a component of the RS1 district intent, and we'll actually be discussing that in our, our next item, uh, what that intent should be and how it should change, if it should change. Um, so, yeah, that is something the city could do, is theoretically have different standards in, in different districts. Okay. It does add some regulatory complexity, kind of like we talked about in the, the last one. Sure. Okay. Um, so anyway, in terms of that, I mean, I think you have a policy, more of a policy justification for RS1 specifically, but um, anyways, I'm in support of protecting significant trees in the city. So um, in terms of the, what was the other piece of that one? The uh, adding some sort of review for new single family developments. I think that would also make sense. I don't think that would necessarily uh, reduce any new housing development because you're not necessarily subdividing. It's probably more somebody that's tearing down a house and redeveloping it for a much bigger house. Um, so if that's what they wanna do, I think you should try and you know at least protect some of the trees on the lot. So. And then the credit system, I just don't, I don't know, I just don't think that's necessary. So those are my thoughts on all of them. Thank you, Commissioner Curry. Um, perhaps what we'll do here to help Ms. Lincoln, uh, we could do a sort of head count like we did on the last one to help her with her data. So I'll perhaps first ask if there's any other general thoughts or comments, Commissioner Goldsman. Thank you, Chair. Um, one thing that I read in the staff report that wasn't <clears throat> talked about today, or maybe I just missed it, is there was, there was some verbiage in the staff report about the right of way and the canopy in the, within the right of way. Can you talk a little bit about that topic and where it fits here? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, uh, thank you, Chair and Commissioner Goldsman. So with the right of way and public lands um, specifically, um, there's currently project underway uh, for an urban forestry plan. Um, so specifically talking about areas that have uh, uh, that aren't just the bluff area or the Minnesota River Valley or uh, areas that don't allow any development at all, so our public lands. And uh, that is being evaluated because the city has kind of a significant amount of control and has the uh, resources in order to enhance the tree canopy or restore the tree canopy through planting in the right of way. Um, we also have kind of benefits of on staff experts that can make decisions like is can a tree of this type go here and be able to mature? Um, because with trees, uh, trees that mature at 30 feet of height need 200 feet of critical root area. Um, so like our city staff can make those determinations in our public lands and in our row. And that has just the benefit of being quickly effective. Um, in cases of low density residential, where these things would trigger, um, aren't very rapid. It'll be kind of here and there, and we may not be capturing the areas that need the most attention as far as tree canopy and getting the benefits from tree canopy. Um, there is a like location in Bloomington in the east side that has 
very high um, or severe um, record of urban heat island. And trees really and really help with that. There's a variety of things that can, um, of course, address urban heat island, uh, limiting impervious surface or things like that. But trees is really one of them, providing tra uh, uh, shade and stormwater um, benefits because of evaporation from leaves can also help cool the air. So cities just have the ability to kind of go in in the public right away if there's space and plant a tree instead of waiting for the trickle of development of this type in order to enhance, like have the most impact and effectiveness of our tree canopy. Um, any other general comments on trees? Um, you know, I have a controversial stance on trees that <laughs> rubs people the wrong way, but I like nice small trees, like just a good young small tree. And um, that's informing some of the way I'm going to think about some of these things. I know that's not the popular stance on trees, but I like a nice young tree. Okay, so why don't we go down the list here, and uh, we'll we'll sort of do a head count on on each of these items. So, uh, those in favor of um, item number one, the text cleanup, I'm in favor. Yes. <clears throat> Yes. Yep. Okay. Number two is the tree preservation standards review. I'm going to say no. 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 Number three is amending the tree removal thresholds, et cetera, as we see on the screen. For me, it's a no. 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 Uh, yes. Okay. And number four is draft and incorporate new tree credit system. It's a no for me. Mm. Commissioner Goldsman? Maybe. Um, I do not like the use of shrubs or landscapes instead of trees. Um, I don't think that they are maintained, nor do they really help with the longevity that a tree can do. So I could be, but I do not like the, the shrubs or other types of plantings instead of a tree. No. Uh, no, don't support credit system. Fantastic. Thank you, Chair and Commission. Slopes. <laughs> so slopes are susceptible to soil erosion. Um, they have incre There's increasing susceptibility from more frequent and severe weather events, um, specifically precipitation uh, weather events. They are very vulnerable to impact stemming from human activities and development. Um, and vegetation and trees are impactful in soil stabilization and stormwater management. So they kind of do double duty um, in keeping the soil stable, but also, you know, helping with uh, water absorption or if there is <coughs> stormwater runoff, um, it helps keep the soil together more so than bare soil. There are three policy options for slopes. First policy option is refining and adding the definition of steep slopes to the code. Currently, there is no definition um, that applies to properties outside of the bluff protection overlay district for steep slopes. So in the steep slope section specifically, there is no definition of what a steep slope is. Um, steep slopes as defined can typically be um, up to the city's discretion um, state statute defines steep slopes as 12 to 18 percent and then 18 percent and higher are like severely steep slopes or bluff. Um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, the web soil survey is where I got this information, they define steep slope as greater than 15 percent and then our own bluff protection overlay district defines steep slope as 18 percent. The benefits of this is we add clear definitions to provide more clarity to residents and regulations. Uh, definitions allow for better monitoring, evaluation, and regulation on applicable parcels. Um, and further, um, in-depth study is likely not required. The challenges are alignment across the code will be necessary 
If we decide to go with state statute or U.S. Department of Agricultural numbers, it'll be outside, out of step with the Bluff Protection Overlay District, but that may be okay. Our Bluff Protection Overlay District is kind of a special district that has unique governance, um, as outlined in the report, because of the watersheds um, and also the lower Minnesota River Valley, um, and it also, um, the slopes lead to water bodies. It leads down to the river. So there's kind of unique governance uh, things there that go into defining steep slopes as 18%. So although it is a consideration, it is not um, uh, an insurmountable barrier. Questions? Commissioner Goldsman. So I guess you're just asking, should we define what a steep slope is? You're not, you're not defining it at a certain percentage yet. Commissioner, so you, can you, Commissioner Goldsman, can you clarify? So when when we go to define a steep slope, are you looking at defining a certain percentage? Is this considered a steep steep slope? You just haven't figured out what that number would be. Yes, that is up to the city's discretion on where steep slope can be. Um, what things that would influence what we would decide are how we want to regulate, um, potential impact of of steep uh, of defining it at that number and then adding regulations. Are we suddenly impacting a ton of properties and making them legally non-conforming or, you know, it, things like that? Also, defining steep slope without additional regulations, like we just define steep slope and now we have a number for it and it's just clarity and there's not any kind of um, restrictive regulations tied to it, then it uh, it really is just about readability and being more in line with, we have a section called steep slopes and we don't define steep slopes. So it's like, you know, it's kind of uh, uh, the start of any process where if we go on to add more steep slope regulations, but we don't define steep slopes, we kind of get in a precarious position on how we're justifying the regulations. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so in discussing kind of in potential impact, um, our current regulations are based off of um, impervious surface calculations that start at 12%. So here is a map that shows all parcels that are average 12% slope or greater, not including the bluff protection overlay district because those already have specific steep slope standards. Um, so the number of residential par uh, parcels impacted by 12% or greater is 1,416. If we redefined average um, slope to 18% to kind of align with our bluff protection district, we would be impacting 300 parcels. Some of those larger parcels um, in yellow are uh, residential, a residential and public land guided. Um, so there is a possibility that those wouldn't even be up for subdivision because we are already managing that land. Um, but um, it's the possibility of, oh, well, I guess in 50 years we might change it. <laughs> we might change the, the standards again, but it does set, up, set us up for some strong reasoning um, uh, for those impacted parcels. So you can kind of see the such a large difference in, in defining steep slopes and possibly having separate regulations for them uh, versus you continuing to use just average slope of 12% or greater. So some of the um, benefits, oh wait, did I already do this? Mm -hmm. This is my fault. I gave you the benefits and challenges twice. Um, so clear de definitions are great. Um, and then uh, the challenges are fairly minor because we are just adding a, de uh, a definition change. So this is uh, this policy action two is add steep slope best practices. Um, that, like I said before, we would have to define steep slope <coughs> as based on policy action number one. But once we did, we can add some steep slope best practices that can be applied to the areas that qualify. Um, so current standards, as I mentioned before, are based on 
uh, impervious surface uh, limits uh, based on average slope categories. So at 12% average slope, you can only have 34% maximum impervious surface co uh, coverage. And as the slope increases, uh, your maximum coverage decreases. So there are some special provisions in the steep slope section that also say that trees um, are a fantastic way to help with stormwater mitigation um, for uh, runoff over steep slopes, as well as surface water redirection, like downspouts pointing away from going down a slope. Um, so those are additional requirements, but um, as far as best practices that people can use to change or to um, meet slope protection standards or steep slope protection standards, um, they could be expanded to give people more options. So this uh, in front of you is the best management practices that are taken from the Bluff Overlay Protection District. Um, I've made adjustments for the language that does not apply or would need to be changed. These best practices allow people who have the capacity to do the best practice to be able to do it with approval of a, a stormwater uh, plan. So this wouldn't be something where it's like, oh, just check the box. They would still have to, we would still have to approve their best management practice um, in this. Um, but it has some things that might require an engineer involved, but it also has some things that are like plant bare areas with, you know, native seedlings or seed species, which could be a much more accessible option for for people um, so it just kind of expands it a little bit and aligns with our bluff over protection overlay district without um, kind of muddying the differences in government uh, governance um, where that one has specific governance but this can be applied broadly so the um, bluff protection overlay district standards were updated in 2020 so they are likely the most updated best management practices um, that we can include um, they give flexibility to property owners and developers, and BMPs would still be reviewed by the relevant staff. Um, and then the challenges are not all bluff protection overlay district code language is relevant citywide. Um, and then I showed you kind of an example of how we could easily adjust in order to make it applicable. So the third op policy action is structure activity restrictions within buffers, uh, within or buffers <coughs> above steep slopes. Um, this limits activity within steep slopes areas or within a certain different uh, distance from above a steep slope um, to prevent slope destabilization. So the two options I outlined in the staff report are were a building, a build or soil disturbance prohibition within the steep slope, so you couldn't do anything at all in a steep slope area, um, or a builder's a soil disturbance uh, prohibition within a certain distance from the top of the steep slope area. Um, so slopes are usually calculated over a horizontal difference, um, and then the high point and the low point to get kind of a percentage of, uh, of what the slope is, but also kind of identifies the part where it starts to slope down into a steep slope. So you identify that top point and you say, you can't do any building or soil disturbance activities um, within five feet of that, or 10 feet of that, or 15 feet of that. Um, so the benefits of this is it <coughs> highly mitigates the risk of steep slope destabilization by basically making sure uh, some, there's very little human activity um, uh, disturbance there. Of course, uh, severe uh, or frequent water uh, precipitation, precipitation weather events could still cause soil disturbance, but human activity would be limited. So the challenges of this one is it's a very restrictive policy and it's a regulation without a clear return or benefit. <coughs> so if we defined 18% slope um, and used uh, as a steep slope and kind of used the 308 properties, how many of those could be subdivided? Um, how many of those um, uh, for these types of things to trigger? Um, how many uh, build or soil disturbance activities would do we currently engage with and would, um, is there any gaps where we would need to add 
more checks for those things. Um, so there's kind of, it's unclear about the return of benefit based on the adjustments that we'd have to make um, for those properties. And also uh, restrictions may give rise to taking arguments from residents because it does restrict use of a property uh, significantly. Also, if we implement this, existing structures within the prohibition area would make them legally non-conforming or make maintenance extremely challenging if they couldn't get equipment back there to maintain a structure that's already <coughs> there. Um, so there would be a, a huge impact for even properties that have things there already. <coughs> Any questions, um, Chair and Commission? Uh, only three options for this one, right? Uh, do you have any more or? Nope, that's it. Okay, we'll go into general discussion on uh, slope policy. You know, the third one, I know the staff report is kind of leaning <coughs> us not to do it, but I kind of like it. I don't know. Like it seems sensible. So I'm kind of 50-50 on that one. I recognize the challenges, but I don't know. It seems like a good idea to me to just, no, we're not going to allow you to do stuff within five feet of a really steep slope that seems practical to me but if I, if I could um actually i'm sorry to interrupt oh, please uh chair commission if i can make a comment so as i was talking about the definitions of slopes there is some discussion about how we categorize um in uh there is a resource that i looked at from pennsylvania that did an extensive analysis on slopes and land use policy as well as kind of looking at the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture web soil survey. Um, they had different ones where it was like zero to 12 or zero to 6% is low or no slope and uh, six to 12 was moderate. And, you know, so they kind of like, you could kind of divide them up where a uh, steep slope could be like 18% slope or higher, but you could have moderately steep slopes that could also have regulations. So that's uh, all of these things would have to be, have the scientific or policy justifications in order to make them defensible. Um, but there is some options to not only just say steep slopes, that's what we're regulating, we could have some other refinement or get more granular, um, especially on things that are just super restrictive or, you know, we don't have to necessarily apply that to all slopes in a large range. Yeah, I think the, the third point is, thank you, Chair. Sure. <laughs> I think the third point is interesting. Um, you know, just a couple gen general points. I think, you know, this is obviously a review of environmental specific, but, um, you know, I think a lot of the interest in Bloomington I mean, is, uh, I mean, I think the environmental <laughs> aspect of Bloomington is what creates a lot of interest in the in the city in general and the slopes and trees and the unique characteristics of it. So. Um, the other thought is, you know, I guess I hadn't seen anything in the whole presentation or not the presentation, but the, uh, packet about environmental justice. So, um, I don't know if that comes into play in any of this. You mentioned the East side and having kind of a, you know, a heat zone and that's obviously a big component of it. So I don't know, just a thought in general. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Albert. I'm sorry, Commissioner Goldsman. <laughs> um, you, you brought up the east side, and when I was looking at the map earlier, um, it seems if you think about how we're approaching this as a city, and the map, you, are there any properties on the east side that are considered steep mm. slope or slope in the yellow or the red? Here we go. So, so close to the bluff area, but not in it. Mm -hmm. So it's not in the Bluff Protection Overlay District in the southeast of the city. There are a few properties. Um, this is an eyeball, of course, but they look like they wouldn't necessarily be up for um, subdivision. Um, so impacting those areas to protect slope would have to occur outside of interventions for plat or subdivision. So you have, if I may, sorry. Please. Um, you've brought subdivision up a few times mm -hmm. so is the goal of this to preserve our landscape preserve our soil our waterways 
or is it to prevent subdivision or to control subdivision? And um, uh, thank you, Chair and Commissioner Goldsman. So in the reference to this, I bring up plat and subdivision because that's where the current intervention is. So slope uh, or these environmental features most often or where planning comes into place or excuse me, where planning comes into the intervention, what we see are plats and uh, subdivisions yeah. and our code kind of reflects that where it's like, oh, if you're doing a building permit or a fence or that, but which don't all require permits or anything like that, we may not um, necessarily uh, capture an environmental feature yep. in that um, because, you know, fences below a certain height don't even require a permit. So we wouldn't know if someone's Got disturbing it. a slope or, or, I mean, I guess a tree coming down might be pretty obvious, but it would be almost co like coincidental that we would notice it right. instead of intentional. So the, the plat subdivision comment is more about where our intervention comes from. That, that helps kind of clarify it for me. Thank you. Other general comments? Okay, I think we're ready to take a head count. Starting with number one, refining and adding the definition of steep slopes to the code. I'm in favor. No. No. Uh, yes. Okay, uh, item two, add steep slope best practices. Yes. No. No. Yes. Lastly, structure activity restrictions with within or buffers ab above steep slopes. Yes. No. No. Uh, hesitant. <laughs> if I may, so, I, uh, remembering this is a study item, so yes may just mean we want to see more information. We want, uh, yes, I'd like to see more information. Okay. Thank you for the guidance. Okay. Um, wildlife. Um, so the city has a various plans that include wildlife and habitat objectives. Um, some of those plans are listed here. Um, this isn't exhaustive, but this is a majority of them. So we have our 2018 Minnesota River Valley Natural and Cultural Systems Plan, our Natural Resources Prioritization and Management Strategies for Bloomington Parks, our Ford 2040 Comprehensive Plan, our Surface Water Management Plan, and our Wetland Management and Protection Plan. Also with wildlife and habitat, there's kind of a lot of ways to support habitat. So things like the urban forest uh, forest plan that I mentioned earlier could also support wildlife um, in talking about restoration and biodiversity and increasing the connectivity between these areas by expanding the habitat and strengthening the habitat. So um, as I mentioned before, the support for the maintenance and establishment of wildlife habitat features are a collaboration across topics in the code, like tree preservation and landscaping and screening, but also the future la uh, uh, possible na native landscaping ordinance. Public lands play a critical role in biodiversity and connectivity of wildlife and habitat areas. They are the largest continuous areas of habitat and connectivity, um, so maintaining those uh, is very important and as represented by the plans, uh, the city, city staff is already um, prioritizing wildlife and habitat in those things. So this map here is the Bloomington Wildlife Corridor. And I say this is, the, this is from the Wildlife Corridor map from the Wildlife Action Network, the Wildlife Action Plan from um, Minnesota DNR. This is just the wild, uh, the Bloomington uh, specific clip to show the kind of local context. So as you can see here, um, we have a lot of areas that are in the bluff or in the uh, na uh, nature areas, nature preservation areas like the lower Minnesota River Valley, um, as well as our public lands and parks. Um, actually, let me. Yeah was another, hold on one moment, I'm just trying to see if. Um, so I'm just skipping ahead a little bit because I think this, this map specifically highlights what's inside of the uh, DNR wildlife corridor. Um, so as you can see, the, the pink 
pinkish areas are our low density residential, um, but we have a significant amount of public lands in yellow, as well as water bodies or uh, non-residential uses. So we have industrial. Um, the two circles represent um, some areas where you could see it in south, uh, the South Loop. Uh, part of the South Loop is technically in the Wildlife Corridor area, according to this map, as well as City Hall and um, surrounding industrial areas. Um, I'll talk a little bit more uh, about kind of the applicability of that as we go through the rest of the policy options, but I thought this was good context to share as I go through that. What were the circles? Oh, those, uh, those represent kind of general areas that have like um, uh, high, like more in Tense development, I guess you could say, because like City Hall, we have industrial uses around us. The railroad tracks um, could be seen as a barrier to wildlife movement, but you know those are here. Um, and then also with uh, South Loop, it's uh, there's some high density residential there. High density medium and high density residential is not part of this study, but it's just kind of showing generally areas that are. Um, have more intense development than the low density residential. Um, so this map here is actually from the Wildlife Action Network report. Um, these identify uh, species of significant concern. Um, and these are, uh, this scoring factors in a couple of things. So the presence of the species, the vulnerability of the species in these areas, um, as well as biodiversity or ecological integrity. So there's kind of a few variables that go into their calculations. Um, and as you can see, like South Loop generally, uh, this the scale isn't quite the same because this map identif doesn't use city level, it's county level. It's more about regional um, resource planning. To get granular, um, the kind of things that end up smoothing those types of numbers are, well, we identified one species here and we're going to apply a buffer to assume it might be here. So it doesn't necessarily uh, look at Bloomington and go, well, it has high density residential, so the species wouldn't be there. Um, they don't kind of calculate it that way. They're much more high level. Um, uh, but for things like the Minnesota River Valley or the Bluff, which have significant more regulation and data and monitoring, you can see that they do uh, indicate high levels of um, presence of species and their particular vulnerability, um, which pri prioritizes them for uh, protection. Um, and these circles represent the same areas in, in the previous map. And I also want to point out that this makes it look like the corridor like isn't connected to uh, the northwest of Bloomington, because this considers things like vulnerability, um, and there's a lot of public lands in that area, it's basically kind of saying, well, they don't have a, they might be present, but they don't have a lot of vulnerability. Um, so they may not be in, that's why it's not indicated on this specific map. Um, so that's why it doesn't look like it's connected. It's not because there aren't um, like great biodiversity or ecological areas there, it's that the vulnerability or other factors um, might bring it off the list of consideration in this specific type of map. So there are four policy options that I'll be going through. So wildlife conservation overlay district. So an overlay district would apply um, specific wildlife and habitat standards to the parcels within the district. The requirement would be based on Bloomington specific ecological requirements to support habitat. And this would potentially impact 6,300 low density residential properties. And that's this map again that kind of shows this. Now of the wildlife um, corridor, 6,300 parcels represents 29.7% of the total area within there um, and then uh, about 32% are public lands, and then the remaining 38% are water bodies um, or non-residential uses. Question? Yes. Uh, can you Chair go back to sure. number one, please? Yes. Um, 
So the first bullet point says, uh, would apply specific wildlife and habitat standards. Yes. Uh, forgive me if I missed it. What are those habitat standards? Um, uh, thank you, Chair and Commission, for that question. So that would actually need to be uh, studied. Um, so that's a data gap. With the Minnesota DNR Wildlife Action Plan, uh, they don't get that granular for data. It's a lot of high-level data um, that kind of has a lot of smoothing. Not that it's not valuable data. It very much is. It's, it's very useful for natural resources planning management at kind of a regional level um, and general objectives, working with um, the DNR works with various conservation organizations in order to go in and target specific areas across the state. Um, and so those kind of happen, you know, they could often happen on like public land all that uh, they would have easy access to, or they make those agreements kind of on a case-by-case -case base, basis with um, property owners on private land. Um, so there's kind of a data gap on what those standards would be. Um, the LA did something similar. They have a wildlife conservation overlay district. And they recently kind of undertook this, and I mentioned it in the report. They started their process in 2014, and it took the consultant seven years to provide the ecological background and data in order to uh, provide the foundation for their ordinance. And then they began drafting their ordinance, and as of, as of um, that went to their governing bodies in 2021, and in 2024, it has not been approved. It is still ongoing. So those kind of like data gaps are huge. Um, they are often required in order to make sure there's proper justification um, and also making sure there's not things like um, uh, regulatory takings for property um, that leave the ordinance vulnerable. So it's not actually impacting or improving wildlife and habitat um, because it's struck down in court or challenged. So, um, in looking at the requirements for the Bloomington context, uh, we don't know. Uh, LA is actually a little different too. They have more vacant land than we do. Um, they have, you know, about 30,000 parcels, um, and 14% of them are vacant. Um, and then parcels can be very large there. So we're looking at a really different context. So we would need the Bloomington specific context and research in order to craft these regulations. Thank you. So it says add steep slope best practices. That is an error on my part. The benefits and challenges are for the policy action number one for wildlife and habitat. So that's just a typo. So the benefits are the results of extensive study would produce highly specific Bloomington data um, that would uh, be useful in multiple contexts, but also just great for the justification for having those standards. Um, and then the challenges, uh, benefits of creating an additional overlay district is unclear um, as, uh, with the available data that we have now. Um, as I mentioned, restrictions may give way to um, regulatory taking, argument, um, taking arguments from residents. Um, and data gaps may not be resolved without significant time, expertise, and funding. Would likely require very specific um, experts and consultants in order to get that type of monitoring. Policy action two is wildlife and habitat education for low density residential properties. Uh, so something we could use that, uh, that DNR corridor information for is identifying, you know, identifying those 6,300 residential properties or even further industrial properties. We could notify every parcel that's within that, within that, um, uh, corridor, um, and distribute information to them that, uh, in various mediums, online, social media, try to maximize our reach and make sure like a letter from the city doesn't end up in the shredder or recycling, recycling. Um, and, um, you know, it starts having an impact. Um, these types of things could include some of the things that a wildlife district, overlay district might 
have as regulation, but have them as options. So you might have wildlife friendly fencing, um, which uh, has uh, ground to bottom of fence clearancing to allow movement of wildlife. Uh, you can encourage uh, different biodiversity and landscaping requirements um, in order to influence, in order to enrich the, the habitat that the wildlife may be in or moving through. So the benefits, it kind of depends on the scope scope of the materials, um, but information and education can be a cost-effective way to raise awareness and influence behavior over time. Um, the opt-in nature of the policy option means that residents can determine their own capacity to implement changes. Some of the wildlife-friendly uh, wildlife fencing could be cost prohibitive. We're kind of in an, an era where we're trying to um, increase home ownership of BIPOC uh, individuals who were historically excluded from home ownership. And then we could implement regulations that then put cost burden on a group that was already excluded from home ownership with a financial consideration. So having an opt in and also changing perspectives and behavior could be a way um, to still have impact without necessarily increasing inequities. Um, and um, resources, are like, resources are likely available to produce these recommendations for residents. So we wouldn't need a consult necessarily consultant to do highly specific Bloomington data in order for us to produce good recommendations to residents who are inside the wildlife corridor. So the lead or responsible department would be to be determined. Um, time resources, data necessary to produce and distribute the materials could be cost prohibitive. This is very dependent on the method that we choose. So maybe a mailer would be not as cost effective, but maybe something like a, a broad, you know, mobile campaign through neighborhoods could, you know, require more staff time or more preparation that could be cost prohibitive. And then effectiveness can be unpredictable or results may only be revealed over a very long timeline. Um, so you might have to trust the process and, um, and keep monitoring to effectiveness. And this might be asking residents, have you made wildlife or habitat um, improving decisions on your property you know, based on your interaction with these materials? Um, so we can have a, provide a variety of ways where we can ask residents these questions and get that information to see if we are actually influencing behavior over time. Policy option three is habitat supportive regulations for low density residential properties. Um, these encourage biodiversity through a variety of standards for native landscaping, tree planting, and water quality. Um, they discourage or prohibit plant species that are detrimental to habitat. So it's things like invasive species that outcompete um, species required for biodiversity. And they can be implemented within landscaping and cre um, scre screening requirements. They don't necessarily have to be a separate um, ordinance or section. And as uh, the benefits, as I mentioned, they can be implemented across multiple points in the code. And then the challenges are um, enforcement would likely fall outside of the planning division. Um, environmental health handles um, most of our um, nuisance or violations. Um, so we would have to coordinate with them to understand the kind of impact or challenges in enforcing this type of code, um, especially for uh, like, you know, if we do native landscaping, but it's in the rear of the, of the property, how do we get our eyes on that to know? Um, and then increase resource cost on low density residential property owners. So if we require native landscaping um, and that comes and how we kind of ensure that it's the proper native landscaping because there's enforcement involved, does that involve a cost for a landscape architect or professionals that could um, increase the cost of owning the home and maintaining it over time? There's difficulty identifying qualifying habitat on a parcel level and monitoring long term. This kind of harkens back to our data gap problem, um, which may impact the effectiveness of regulations. So now we have wildlife supportive policies for low density residential properties. This is not inclusive of habitat supportive activities. 
These are things like access to food, reproduction, life cycle events, and sleeping areas. So it's really about mobility, movement, connectivity. Um, and these are include the things I mentioned previously, which might be wildlife friendly fences or structure setbacks or buffers um, that make it so that way movement is not impeded through fencing or structure type, uh, various structure types. Um, the benefits is it mitigates harm to wildlife through fencing. Certain types of fencing can entangle or harm or even uh, kill wildlife uh, in some cases or depending on the, you know, the, the quality or the condition of the fence. And this facilitates movement and connectivity of the wildlife as they travel uh, uh, across the landscape, which also could give them access to areas um, that are public land that would already kind of facilitate freedom of movement. So it's about getting wildlife safe access to that wherever they may be in the wildlife corridor. So challenges uh, are similar to the habitat supportive policies is that enforcement and monitoring would be really difficult. Um, many structures do not require permits. So if someone has, um, you know, a, a garage or excuse me, like a shed that's below a certain amount, they could put that up um, and that could have impact on, on, on these uh, factors of movement or, um, or even just access to food. New requirements could also create a significant number of non-conforming structures. So if there's a setback requirement um, or wildlife friendly fences, we've suddenly brought a bunch of fences into non-conformity um, or those structures into non-conformity and we would have to figure out how to solve that issue. Um, and then also economy of scale means that additional costs for fencing or structure placement could further limit housing development just because the cost of housing development like these types of things could be a significant percentage of the total project because the project isn't so large that it would kind of produce um, a profit either through home ownership or renting. Um, so that you might be able not be able to get the the pro forma or the books to balance even for a small development, um, and that could restrict housing development. Um, that is something that could be um, studied, but it would obviously take more time before we would have that information. We do want to collaborate with many small developers to understand where their costs come from and how things like this would come into play. Okay, there's our wildlife and habitat. General comments? Um, I have one comment uh, just on the second one in that um, I like the idea of education, but I think I'm only supportive of it in a no cost format. I don't like the idea of new flyers or anything that would be mailed out. I think those go right in the recycling, but if it showed up in the Bloomington briefing and mm -hmm. there's a map and you see that your house is in the colored area, you're probably likely to read that or check it out or something like that. So Commissioner Goldsman. Yeah, I would, I would second that. But I would also ask, would this be in the purview of the Sustainability Commission from a you know, sustainability, wildlife, habitat, mm -hmm. you know, making it, us more sustainable as a city, is this? I think it certainly does from uh, getting their opinion on it and helping craft the language or something to that effect, mm -hmm. sure. But I don't think that prevents us from giving our opinion on it. One other comment Please. that I have is, and I'm not familiar with the fencing that's been being discussed, but the, the practicality in my mind of that, um, the gap, um, is extremely low thinking about people that have pets. The reason I have a fence is because mm. I have a dog and um, actually it's the other way around. I have a dog because I have a fence, but, um, and I also, I see it from, from having, you know, children with uh, balls and things that can go underneath and I can see that be posing problems. So I just don't think the practicality of those fences, albeit an interesting idea, um, is feasible as well as how, um, developed and fenced our neighborhoods are today. It just doesn't, doesn't seem like that's a real good solution, but that's my two cents. Commissioner Curry. Yeah, I would agree with all that. I think the, the fencing is difficult and I don't think from what I understand, anybody wants to get into regulating fencing anymore. So, um, uh, and then any low cost or no cost way to educate the city about, um, you know, wildlife and 
and slopes and trees and that sort of thing, I think is a, a good idea. Okay, we'll go down the list here. Number one is Wildlife, Conver- Con- wildlife Conservation Overlay District. I'm a no. 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 Nope. Number two is Wildlife and Habitat Education. I am a yes, if, no, or low cost. Agreed. 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 Okay, thank you. Uh, item number three is Habitat habitat Supportive Regulations. I'm a no. 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 And please more thought on that. So I, the other thought is, I kinda, again, going back to RS1 again, I think that's what RS1 is supposed to be for is – don't need to add a bunch of other regulations to the city. You can do it through the the zoning district that already exists. But okay. And finally, number four is wildlife supportive policies. Uh, I'm a no. 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 Nope. All right. So in summary, um, I have listed all of the policy um, actions that I've gone over. Um, And then I've color coded them. I've highlighted what the staff recommended uh, actions were for the best anticipated benefit cost outcomes. So for the cost for resources and labor, these could have um, potentially the best uh, outcomes. Um, The yellow options were options that the staff had identified as having potential, but having likely high cost burdens uh, right out the gate. So also, so internally in the city and on staff and our resources uh, to pay for these uh, for data gaps or produce the policy and then also possibly having impacts on the other side um, that could it um, impact the affordability of owning a home after someone has purchased it or um, is renting it um, some of those burdens could be passed on in lease agreements and that could be really difficult for people looking for housing. Uh, also, um, and then the red is not staff recommended because challenges are likely prohibited. Um, none of these recommendations mean that we can't could do further study on more specific things, um, but just based on the available information and over the last several months of research, this is just kind of what has shaken out. And then in summary, um, let me, I'm just doing a quick check here on the alignment between planning commission and staff recommendations. So in uh, we uh, planning commission and staff recommendations align um, on uh, trees. So text cleanup for clarity, no regulation um, uh, there. And then also a, uh, but not on the amending tree removal thresholds. So not going down the road of using discretion to kind of find a right fit when we already have robust standards. For slopes, um, pretty much split down the line. (laughs) We have two yeses and two noes for all of our options. Um, That could mean uh, bringing more study um, or uh, waiting for direction from city council to see if we actually want to implement those things. And then for wildlife and habitat, we had four yes for our wildlife and habitat education for low density residential properties. Um, So I will make sure to summarize those uh, uh, discussion items and recommendations from Planning Commission in my report um, uh, with the caveats of things like the no cost method, including Sustainability Commission, um, the practicality of some of these things uh, based on people choosing to make choices with fences or other things that are fitting uh, the lifestyle or needs. Whoops, I stopped it. No, that's an extra slide. And we're, we're done. Thank you so much. Um, it's, are there any additional uh, questions or discussion items from uh, the chair and commission? Seeing none. Uh, thank you very much. Great, great way to summarize this. And it was really easy for us to follow. So thank you for your, for your work on that. Uh, thank you, Chair Cookton and Commission. I'm very pleased. I had a lot of anxiety about condensing the information. So your feedback is extremely welcome. Thank you. Planning Commission, another five minute recess. I think the next item will be not as short. So is that okay? Sure. 
we can discuss other options when we return. Uh, 957.
Okay, we're back uh, for item number four, which is uh, the city of Bloomington is the applicant again, and we're just going to talk about RS1 zoning district study. Mr. Ramler Olson, you have the staff report. Good evening. Good evening. Just want to check. Uh, is everyone able to hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, terrific. Uh, okay, I'm speaking through my computer, so I'm glad uh, that's functioning. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, members of the Planning Commission. I will share my screen with the presentation. One second. Okay. So, uh, well, here, let's go back to the, the uh, title slide. Uh, yes, yeah, so the this is item number four on tonight's agenda. It's a study item looking at the RS1 district. Um, generally speaking, it is going to be dis discussing the entire district, but we'll focus in on some, uh, some aspects of that district, uh, some of the standards, and we'll review some staff drafts of potential amendments to development standards, uh, the purpose statement for the RS1 district, uh, bulk standards, environmental standards, and allowed uses. A little bit of background. This is the uh, this is the location of uh, existing RS1 lots within the city of Bloomington. Uh, it's been split up into four areas. Staff felt this was helpful. Um, we have Forest Haven uh, in the north, and this is all west of Normandale Boulevard. Uh, Greenbrier, uh, that's another area just uh, south, south of Forest Haven, uh, Timberglade, and uh, there were two lots um, along Normandale Boulevard that are also zoned RS1. Looking at the standards of the district or the existing standards, uh, there's a minimal lot area of 33,000 square feet. That'll be very important to consider at, uh, throughout this presentation. Uh, minimum site width of the interior lots are 60 feet. Corner lots is 100 feet. Um, there's some there's some nuance to the minimum site width. Um, that also uh, includes the language just below that, uh, meeting the site width at the front yard setback line, as well as the first feet, 50 feet beyond the front setback line. There's also considerations of median site width, and I'll get into that later in the presentation. And some other standards that you're probably pretty familiar with looking at other districts. This analysis will be split up into essentially six sections. There'll be some other discussion points after that. But nonetheless, there's going to be looking at the intent first, uh, lot area and width, steep slopes, conservation corridors, uh, uses within the RS1 district, and uh, a bulk standard uh, known as a prevailing setback. So this is a comparison of the current intent statement for the RS1 district, as well as uh, something that staff has drafted. Um, it's it's not obviously set in stone. Uh, we want your your feedback and your guidance to how to you know if if you're happy with it or if you felt it could be improved in other areas, please let us know. Um, but this is uh, I'm highlighting the uh, main differences between the current and the draft intent statement getting into those more specific parts of the intent statement. Um, it starts out by saying that the RS1 provides locations for a large lot single family development. Um, some optional changes that staff has drafted, noting some of the use, um, use changes we're proposing. We've come up with these options. Uh, the first one provide locations for a large lot, low density residential. We've struck single family because as will be explained later, we're proposing that two family dwellings be allowed in the RS1 district. The second option is to provide lot, um, it reads, uh, provide locations for large lot, single family and other compatible residential development. So still maintaining that single family, but we're also making note that there's other compatible resident residential development that uh, we're proposing be allowed within the RS1 district. Um, the intent statement uh, continues uh, where it, it lists the characteristics of RS1 lots. Um, it notes that uh, there's steep slopes, uh, significant vegetation, wetlands, or uh, uh, RS1 lot includes areas that are substantially development as large lots in order to preserve the character of the area. Um, staff notes that there is an ore within that, within that 
which implies that only one characteristic characteristic has to be met in order for a lot to be um, to be uh, considered consistent with the RS1 district. Um, staff in, in light of that, staff recommends increasing that to multiple characteristics. Um, we're, we, we don't feel that that's enough to maintain the uniqueness of the RS1 district to only allow or, or have one characteristic satisfy the intent of the district. So um, that would also help clarify the ability for other areas of the city that want to rezone to RS1, give them some confidence in their ability to do so if uh, if we maintain that uniqueness of the RS1 district by having multiple characteristics considered for those uh, requests. Um, we've included a new characteristic, um, large lot, low density residential area, um, is in areas located within a conservation corridor as designated by the Minnesota uh, DNR. Um, I believe Michelle ran through some of those uh, corridors in her presentation, and that's been uh, considered as part of uh, staff's drafts of uh, changes to RS1. Um, and it should be noted that this was, um, including the uh, the conservation corridor is a response to some of the environmental concerns that were expressed by residents during consideration to amendments to the R1 district uh, last year. This is a map uh, displaying the extent of the conservation corridors in the city. I guess um, something to point out is um, it, it covers a lot on the west side, not so much on the east side. It's clearly uh, going to be gathered along the uh, the bluffs of the uh, Minnesota River. Continuing on with the analysis of the intent statement, uh, some discussion items. Uh, by the way, uh, these discussion items are are going to be throughout this presentation. So if, if you want to just hit on them right away, or if you want me to save them towards the end, we can do either one, but, um, and then feel free to interrupt if you want more clarification, sir, certainly. Um, the first uh, discussion item is, again, that beginning of the, uh, the intent statement. Um, some of the options are to not change it. Uh, there's option two provided, provide locations for a large lot, low density residential development against striking single family because we're gonna be considering two family dwellings within uh, the use table for the RS1 district. The third option, provide locations for large lot single family and other compatible residential development. So um, maybe I'll ask the planning commission how you would like to proceed. Would you like to discuss this first or should I just keep barreling through? Well, commissioners, it would be uh, my opinion that we do these one by one as we go through them um, so we don't forget and they're fresh on our mind. But if people have other thoughts, Commissioner Goldsman, I can. I, let's go through them now. Yeah. Okay. We'll do that now, and we'll follow the same format we've been using this evening. Uh, first, we'll start with general discussion. Um, these are a little different than I guess the first couple we've gone through because it's a little bit more of an either or. But um, we'll start with general discussion on this item, Commissioner Goldsman. Thank you, Chair. So I, so I appreciate staff looking into this as they were asked to do so um, by council. Um, so I, I want to make sure that statement is there so that you don't take this as a comment against the work, the good work that you're doing. Um, this should, looking at the parcels that are considered RS1, in my opinion, this should not be priority as for the city. Um, I don't feel that RS1, as we looked at the number of parcels, makes a great impact to the overall city as a whole. Um, it also doesn't look at how we're addressing housing and ensuring equity across our city. Um, I know that it was asked of by council to look at these lots for a potential subdivision to potentially create more housing stock in the city. And when I looked at the properties on line on in the maps, 
only two properties that I could see were potential maybe candidates for that. The rest of them are very established homes that are actually at the higher dollar value of all of the housing stock in Bloomington. And the likelihood of those property owners taking that house and subdividing it is very small. Um, more likely they'll tear that house down and build a bigger home. Um, the two properties that I thought were a maybe were the 10616 and the 10626 Normandale Boulevard. Um, I actually see it more likely that those two properties be combined and rezoned at more higher density as it is on a collector street. So I was disappointed to see this topic on our agenda today. Um, I'll be, again, not staff. Um, I just think we have bigger initiatives, bigger opportunities within our city than to address these handful of parcels that really don't need to be addressed. My two cents. Thank you, Commissioner Goldsman. Commissioner Curry. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so I uh, agree with part of Commissioner Goldsman's comments um, in that, yeah, I, well, and I should start again by saying that this, we're looking at this because of the work that our neighborhood did with the city council. So um, I see this more as what I alluded to in the previous topic as potentially, I would say, environmental preservation in certain neighborhoods. So, um, I mean, our neighborhood being one of them, as well as some neighborhoods, I think, along Nine Mile Creek and along the Bluff District. So, yeah. So I don't, I mean, you, I don't think you're going to get many houses out of this or many new, you know, new places to live, but I think it would potentially afford the opportunity for some neighborhoods to retain uh, the existing trees and um, character of their neighborhood, I suppose. Thank you, Commissioner Curry. You know, when we um, had some joint sessions with the HRA a couple of years ago about the R, I think it was the R1 district, not RS1, but R1, one of the comments I specifically remember making because we were going through this kind of laundry list of items, should staff look at this, should staff look at that. I specifically remember making a comment of something about lot combination and that it seemed really impractical that this would actually be implemented on a scale that's worth the city staff time to do this. Uh, I appreciate Mr. Rammer Olson, and if you look at the staff report, it's well done. I mean, there's, it's long, it's comprehensive, it's clearly been looked at. But I have to agree with Commissioner Goldsman on this, that I don't think it was a terribly good use of, of staff time and, frankly, tax dollars to look into this. I think it's bearing out exactly the way we thought it would, that, you know, you've got large houses that are already nice. And if they're going to be subdivided, the existing house is going to be in the middle of the lot, not on the side. So you have to tear down the house and then build two new houses. And if you're going to go through all that effort, they're going to be really high end houses to get your money back. And so we haven't done anything for home equity or any of it. I, I, I just see very little value in, in what has been looked at here. And again, not staff's fault on this one. So getting back to the issue at hand for me, um, as far as this intent statement goes, I don't have a great preference. I did drive uh, these neighborhoods before I came over here tonight to try to understand neighborhood feel. I've, I, I don't live in one of these neighborhoods. I, I'm frankly not even that familiar with them. Um, you know, they're, they're actually more dense than I thought they were. For as big as the lots are, the houses are, maybe it's because they're so big, but they're pretty close. It's not like some cities you go through and they're really secluded and whatever. They're fairly close, and I think it's actually just driving through kind of dense. And so switching this language to low density instead of single family um, does not bother me. Commissioner Albrecht. Thank you, Chair. Um, I agree with this, and I think I agree with the comments made already. And I also think that staff did a fantastic job on this. However, it does seem to be located in West Bloomington. Uh, only and in a more affluential part of West Bloomington. Um, and I just 
think we need to be really careful about what um, we're diving into in terms of our, our equity lens um, and creating new housing and our resources. Yes, I agree with Commissioner Curry that you know we should be thinking about our wildlife and natural resources, but we should be thinking about that across the city, not in these specific very few parcels in the city of Bloomington. Thank you, Commissioner Albrecht. And I'm not sure if I'm getting out of order because I don't exactly know what's coming up next, but um, I will make one other comment in case I forget that there was a comment in the staff report that we're doing some of this because there's been petitions to make other neighborhoods RS1. And when you, you spoke about equity and I'm not super interested in other neighborhoods in Bloomington becoming RS1. To me, it's hard to overlook the fact that other areas wanted to become RS1 once a duplex was made somewhere else. And it's real hard for me to see an argument of, well, we're doing this for the environment. If that was the case and, and these other neighborhoods really wanted to protect the environment, I think we would have heard about it earlier. And so I think there's a lot of complexities to this. And I'm fine with the existing RS1 neighborhoods we have. I don't think, you know, having neighborhoods with larger lots and having we talk about a diversity of housing stock and i'm not against having some housing stock that is for the higher end of the market like we should try to serve everybody and so i'm not in favor of saying we got to get rid of rs1 and we can't have large lots because we do have more affluent people that want to move to bloomington and we need to support them too so i'm not against the existing rs1 we have but i'm real hesitant about making other neighborhoods into rs1 that give more restrictions on Subdiv uh, subdividing and stuff. I'm not super interested in crafting uh, a bunch of policies here that is going to foster that. Okay. Uh, without seeing any further discussion, this is a little different as I look at it than our last two items because we're not really voting one, two, three. This is kind of a I want one, I want two, or I want three. So I think we'll actually just go down the line here and, and I'll ask which you prefer if that's okay. So uh, for me, for this particular in, uh, statement, um, I would prefer number two. And I think um, I'll just say I think it's okay to have some commentary. I'm split between something or whatever if you're not sure. I, I think one. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm leaning towards one. No change. Uh, I have no preference. Yeah, I think uh, I think one. I mean, honestly, I don't see anybody. I, I think it'd be difficult to build duplexes in lots that are thirty-three thousand square feet. It costs too much money to acquire a lot. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Moving on. Moving on. There we go. Uh, so some more discussions. Uh, more uh, points of discussion. Uh, Again, still examining the intent statement, um, as was made, or as a, a point that I made earlier, is that staff is uh, recommending that multiple characteristics be used in assessing applications for rezoning. Uh, right now, uh, there is only the the or in the, the statement only uh, it, it implies only one characteristic it needs to be satisfied, but multiple seems to strengthen. The RS one's RS one district's intent. Um, so, uh, but nonetheless, uh, we wanted to turn this over to planning commission to see if they're comfortable with multiple characteristics being considered. Um, and it doesn't have to be two. Uh, so, also getting um, an idea of what the correct number of characteristics to use when we're assessing rezoning applications. Mr. Rambler Olson, could you just run through that list again with us, please? Yeah, certainly. Um, so this is this is uh, of course uh, referring to the draft that staff has uh, um, has um, has well, I'm sorry, this, <laughs> that has written up. Uh, but there is also some characteristics to be considered in the, the current form of the intent statement. But um, as you'll see on the slide, um, the characteristics being steep slopes. Uh, significant natural or native vegetation, uh, wetlands, um, 
if the area is located within a conservation corridor designated by the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources and or substantially developed as large lots in order to preserve the character of the area. So those are the characteristics. Thank you. Um, I'm going to make one general comment, um, you know, based on the discussion we've just had. Uh, I know some of us are not a huge fan of this just in general coming to us, but city council has proposed this and I think it's our duty to provide them opinions um, on these individual items as we see fit. So we'll continue forward uh, with these uh, more fine detailed things. Um, for me, um, I like having more than one just because I'm in favor of not allowing more as one district. So I don't necessarily know if I feel like all of them is fair because I think you maybe get yourself into problems where you don't have this one little thing, even though generally speaking it is appropriate or whatever. So I don't know what the right number is, if it's three or two, or if it's even, I don't know, it needs to be left to somebody's discretion, but I like some number between um, one and all. <laughs> Commissioner Albrecht. Uh, <laughs> this one is tough and I think it should be all <clears throat> because I think if you're creating a district I think if you're if your intent of the district is such that it to preserve large lots I would just say all of them Commissioner Goldsman Thanks. Uh, so thinking about the list, one of the things that I think about is some of these large lots that are currently RS1 are in very uh, just sloped areas. I'm not going to say steep sloped because we just talked about that, but they're very sloped. Um, they are not necessarily in wetlands. So there's a little bit of a differ differentiation there. Um, so I would say not all could be in wetlands, but the slope piece could. Um, I also think about what is the what is the area that could actually be developed in these large lots. So if they do have wetlands, can they develop in it? And at what percentage? And then does that hit their developable location? And I'm thinking about that lot that we had the other day that was that long skinny lot and they divided it into two and the garage was actually in the watershed district. There's a lot of that wonkiness. So again, the practicality of this is tricky because how, how much area would they actually be able to develop it? I don't know. That's my two cents. Commissioner Curry. Uh, when I read the report, I think it recommended two, and that made sense to me. So, Okay, we'll summarize by going down the line. I'm going to say two and a half. <laughs> two. As many as possible. Two. Okay. Two and a half. Okay. Um, moving on. Uh, so staff did a couple of analyses looking at lot area and width. Um, the, these analyses were conducted at two scales, citywide and neighborhood, so something broader and then something more uh, granular. Uh, there's disclaimers that you may have noticed in the staff report, and that I'll just briefly touch upon. Uh, median site width is a requirement to be used uh, for, um, for RS1 lots. Um, but it was not used in the citywide analysis and it's not, and what was uh, attempted for the neighborhood analysis is not survey level accurate. So when we get applications, we would expect very um, accurate drawings uh, showing median site width to establish that a lot is complying with the RS1 district. S staff just doesn't have those tools available. So we did the best we could. Um, uh, for the citywide analysis, we use lot frontage as a proxy for median site width, but there's significant differences and shortcomings by using lot width as a placeholder for median site width. Um, that's spelled out in the staff report. 
Uh, we did not consider all physical site limitations, such as light uh, lot configuration, where the structure is currently located on these lots, um, stormwater management. Um, so that's that's a deficiency of these uh, analyses that we had to consider. Um, corner lots require higher higher lot widths, but that data is just not readily available uh, at a citywide level um, within a citywide database. So that again skews the um, the analysis. Um, so um, starting with that citywide analysis, we examined all R1 lots. Um, there are over 20,000 uh, in the city. And when comparing it to the uh, minimum lot area for the RS1 district, which is presently 33,000 square feet, um, and we subjected those, uh, those R1 lots to a lot frontage of 60 feet, that's the current uh, site width, for uh, RS1 lots, but again, there's there's nuance and differences with how how that's being measured. We found 509 lots uh, met those two measures. Here's a geographic representation of where those are located. You're going to find a lot of them follow the uh, the the the, um, the conservation corridor. Actually, you'll you'll see some overlap between where these lots exist and. How they line up with that corridor where the bulk of those lot these lots exist. So again, 509 total out of um, uh, 1400 or yeah, 1400. Um, looking uh, at uh, how many R1 lots meet the minimum lot area um, that was proposed during consideration of the R1 amendments, I I'll just back up a little bit and provide a, some context to that. So there was a um, there was a lot area that was suggested during consideration of the R1 amendments, and that was to lower the minimum lot area from 33,000 square feet to 22,000 square feet. That's roughly half an acre. And coincidentally, it actually ma uh, matches the lot area of the previous iteration of the RS1 district. The RS1 district came into being in 1986. It was developed from the RS2 district. I don't know how they went from RS2 to RS1, but I wasn't there at the time. I'm sure there was some logic to it. Um, but nonetheless, um, uh, 22,000 square feet was the uh, previous incarnation of the large lot residential district in Bloomington. It was then raised to 33,000 square feet and then renamed to RS1. So we found 1,400 lots that met the uh, minimum lot area, 22,000 square feet, um, as well as that minimum uh, lot frontage of 60 feet. This is, uh, again, this is a map showing where these lots are located. Again, a lot of them are clustered in those areas that are within the conservation corridors. Um, so when we go down to the finer grain analysis, looking at those specific um, RS1 areas that were mentioned in that other slide, those four areas, or just the three areas, I'm sorry, the two lots were excluded from this analysis. Um, we just focused on the um, uh, Greenbrier, uh, Forest Haven, and Timberglade. Um, we found that there were, uh, oh, and for this particular analysis, we weren't obviously looking for rezoning because there are RS1 already. So how many would be potential candidates for subdivision or infill development under the uh, the current minimum lot area standard, which if you, in order to split it, would have to be double that, so 66,000 square feet. We found only two lots that would potentially be subdividable. Um, this, is, this is staff's analysis, but again, um, a more fine grade analysis might yield different results. Um, when we uh, compare those lots to um, the uh, that 22,000 square uh, minimum lot area of 22,000 square feet, that standard that was proposed last year during consideration of R1 amendments, uh, we found 10 lots. So again, if we lower from 33,000 to 22,000 square feet, you find 10 lots that might be subdividable. Again, there's a lot of criteria to satisfy in order to do that. Um, we also, uh, um, reviewed uh, these uh, these results uh, um, against the uh, total assessed value of the the properties that are zoned RS1, and um, for those that were able to be subdividable, um, uh, counting for a uh, an assessed value of 
six thousand hundred or six hundred thousand dollars or less. We only found one lot, and we used six hundred thousand dollars. I mean, again, this is staff's opinion about what would make financial sense to maybe consider splitting a lot. It's that's up for discussion if that was the per, correct dollar figure, but that's what we went off of. And we only found that one lot again, it's been the same lot actually in all the analyses so far. And then when we, um, again, go back to that 22,000 square foot minimum lot area, there are 30, there are three lots that are potentially subdividable. So one in each, um, RS one area. Uh, I'll continue on. Um, so. Staff also wanted to see what our peers were doing in uh, other sub uh, suburban communities. And so we looked at the uh, large lots, the, some of the, the area standards and intense uh, statements of large lots in our peer communities. Um, uh, we looked at eight in, uh, specifically, and um, you'll see a table at the bottom of the slide showing the results of that analysis. The median value of the minimum lot areas for all the large lot areas within these communities was 30,000 square feet. So we're kind of hitting that already at 33,000 square feet. Um, but then we also compared uh, what that minimum lot area for the large lot district compared that to the smallest single family district within those communities. And we uh, there's a ratio of comparing the minimum lot area for both districts and that's on the very right hand of this uh, of this table, um, I'm not. Uh, that data kind of yields different ratios from you know 1.5 all the way up to 4.6. We're um, I believe we're in the I think we're around 4.3. Uh, Bloomington is currently 4.3. Um, so again, we're kind of in line with other communities with uh, our peers or other our peer communities. So some discussion points, uh, taking all that information that was presented to you, um, is the current minimum air, lot area 33,000 square feet in the RS1 district appropriate for a large lot district? Should it be adjusted to 22,000 square feet? That's pro again, approximately half an acre, should be lowered down to 22,000 square feet, knowing um, what that the effect it would have on other properties entering um, the RS1 district and the subdividability of current RS1 lots. Um, is there a different area requirement that you'd like staff to consider um, and study further? So I just leave that up to you. General discussion. I'll start. Um, kind of already said it, but I don't feel the need to reduce to 22,000 square feet. For one, I don't have a problem with us having a zone that has larger lots. It, it, it diversifies our housing stock. If we want to have big, beautiful homes somewhere, I'm fine with it. This is a very small percentage of our lots. We're we talking one tenth of a percent or something of our the lots in the city. It's, it's a very small portion, so I don't see it as an equity problem. Um, and secondly, um, it's again just the impracticality of this making any difference. If we reduce to 22,000 square feet. Maybe we'll see a couple of redevelopments with lot splitting, but they're not going to be affordable. If the point if the point is to create affordable housing, this isn't it. So that's where I'm at. Commissioner Albrecht. Thank you, Chair. I completely agree. <clears throat> I think the minimum lot area of thirty three thousand square feet is appropriate. Commissioner Goldsman. Ditto. Commissioner Curry. Uh, I'm just going to say, I think 22,000 square feet is appropriate because it's the proportionate reduction, uh, from what R1 also had to keep it in line with R1. Very well. Okay. So moving on, uh, median lot width. Well, first I will, uh, introduce median lot width. Uh, before we get into the discussion point. So um, as stated in that second bullet, site width for all single and two family residential lots in, in RS1 and R1A um, has um, approved or modified by the city after a certain date, August 31st, 2006, uh, uh, has, has to meet or exceed 80% of the median site width of existing lots wholly or partially located within 500 feet of the perimeter of the proposed subdivision. Um, 
this uh, the issues that were noted at the time of this creation, I think it was around 2000, oh, was it 2004, 2000, something like that, um, early aughts, let's put it that way. So this standard was introduced because uh, there was an attempted lot split and uh, there was a lawsuit brought um, on behalf of the, uh, the property owner that was trying to split his lot. Um, brought against the city because the city denied the, the lot split, the city lost. And in response to that, uh, ordered staff to create a, um, a way to measure medians uh, or to, uh, to uh, measure lot width that was more contextual, that took into consideration the context. However, some of the issues that were noted at the establishment was that it lowered values of, uh, or could lower the values of property that were subdividable without the median lot width standard. Um, it would result in fewer subdivision opportunities and fewer homes would be created. Um, lots would most likely need to be larger to be subdividable, therefore more expensive. And it would just re increase regulatory complexity on the part of staff. We wouldn't be able to provide a very um, prompt service to customers that were that were interested or residents that were interested in splitting their property. So in light of that, um, is the median site with an appropriate standard to maintain for um, establishing new RS1 lots? Discussion? Commissioner Curry? Uh, I, I think you can just leave it. I, I don't think anything's gonna change. Commissioner Goldsman? I, I agree, and I, I'm concerned if we take it, you know, was it put in place because of that situation and that lawsuit, right? So it doesn't, I don't think removing it, it seems prudent, especially if we don't change anything within the RS1 district. I agree with you, Commissioner Goldsman. We've seen without naming anything specific, but how one very small thing can derail an entire evening and get in the way of doing real, I don't say real, getting in the way of doing other city business for something that could have just been prevented. And so I'm in favor of just leaving it the way it is. I don't want to see even one of these super contentious things where we get angry neighbors and then people just don't like each other. And then you've got neighbors that never like each other because they've, they've done this. And I think this is a way to just prevent that, keep it as it is. Um, any thoughts, Commissioner Albrecht, or I'll move on. Okay, moving on. Okay, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, moving on to uh, the steep slope uh, section of the intent statement for RS1 districts. Um, lots in the R1, R1A, and RS1 districts are subject to sleep, uh, steep slope standards. Um, the uh, Our city code, it doesn't specifically identify slopes of 12% or greater as steep slopes, but it is, it is implied by how the section of code is presented. So um, this is a this is an interpretation by staff that slopes of 12% or greater are considered steep. Um, you, uh, this map shows which lots, um, or uh, yeah, which um, R1 lots are um, have an average uh, slope on their property of 12% or greater. So which ones qualify as steep slopes? So again, just a geographic distribution of those lots. And with that in mind, um, are steep slopes an appropriate characteristic by which to assess the lots candidacy for the R RS1 district? Thank you. Uh, where I'm at is I feel the same way as I did earlier. I, I worry that four neighbors on one side have 12% and four neighbors, four neighbors on the other side do. And there just happens to be one kind of flattish lot that's only a 10% slope. And then we've got a weird thing where there's a a weird parcel that can't be rezoned. So um, I'm gonna say no on this. Commissioner Curry. I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. 
Commissioner Goldsman. Agreed. Okay. Okay, Mr. Ramlin Olson. Uh, yes, Chair. A uh, bit of clarification. Uh, steep slopes already are a characteristic of lots that um, of RS of lots within the RS1 district. So, um, if you're saying that it's not an appropriate characteristic, are you asking staff to then that we should consider removing that from uh, consideration of RS1 lots? Because here I'll, I'll go back to if if you don't mind, I will Please. go back to the current intent statement. Wow, I'm really going up. Okay, so again on the left, uh, provide locations for large lot single family development in areas of steep slopes. So we are um, providing some clarity clarity of what a steep slope is by referencing the section. That's what uh, the draft intent uh, draft uh, intent statement shows. Uh, we're just providing some of that clarity. Um, the if if you don't mind um, to address yeah, the the scenario you brought up about two lots um, abutting a, a fairly flat lot. Um, the 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 rezoning to RS1 would would be um, it wouldn't have um, not all lots would have to satisfy I mean depending on how the uh, the rezoning is brought forth to the city not all lots would have to satisfy all the characteristics again there's um, there's maybe a, a a threshold that we would like to get input on as well is you know what's considered um, a, uh, a, a a good amount of the, the loss being considered or rezoning to this part to a particular district because um, ideally districts should, should be contiguous. So that means some lots maybe get caught up in, or may get caught in the in the consideration for rezoning. So not all lots will have these characteristics. A majority will. Um, presently, our, um, there are some RS1 areas where not all lots within the identifiable RS1 area um, even meet the uh, minimum lot area. So there is um, some, some nuance to this. It's just trying to establish a district and it's up to the discretion of the city that not all lots need to necessarily satisfy this criteria, but we want to offer this to how do we assess the majority or what whatever threshold that the city decides is is worth considering for a rezoning so i just wanted to throw that in there and maybe that would uh add a little bit more information to this uh this prompt yes. for, uh, for discussion thank you for that additional information and as you were talking about it you had something very similar to that in the staff report and that's uh, my fault for forgetting for forgetting that so thank you for that clarification that does change my mind uh that does change my mind, and in the spirit of limiting uh, creation of new RS1 districts, I would be supportive then of this 12% slope thing. Commissioner Albrecht? Uh, agreed. Commissioner Goldsman? <laughs> um, as long as it's, when we talked about it being a characteristic, one of plus another... I think that makes sense based on what we were just discussing. Commissioner Curry. Yep, I would agree with that. Okay, thank you for that clarification, Mr. Ryan Wilson. Oh. You're welcome, uh, Chair, members of the Planning Commission. Uh, moving on. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, this analysis also looked, I mean, it looked at the 33,000 square feet as well as the 22,000 square feet for which parcels have an average slope that would consider them to have steep slopes. So, oh, that's R1 parcels, but nonetheless, let's keep moving on. Uh, going on to conservation corridors, um, those are included in the uh, draft RS1 statement, as I mentioned before, based on the feedback from engagement during consideration of the R1 amendments last year, um, that uh, the area of the conservation corridors is extensive on the west side. It um, it covers a lot. It's um, it, there is a, it's fairly well developed in, in, in many parts. It includes a lot of land uses such as residential, office, industrial, institutional. Um, a lot of the area where you are right now is within the conservation corridor. 
And um, something that staff wanted to uh, um, wanted to emphasize is that um, conservation corridors were not really meant as a regulatory tool. They're they're meant informationally uh, for cities in order to develop uh, plans for prioritizing natural resource restoration, restoration or protection efforts. So um, this was one way to uh, that staff thought of satisfying that request from residents last year, but we, um, but staff does have reservations about including it as a criterion. Um, uh, I already mentioned the first two bullets. Um, the third bullet on this, uh, this slide uh, mentions uh, adopting a regulatory tool to protect conservation areas identified in the, uh, the conservation corridor boundaries could have land use implications for a wider scale mix of properties that may be, um, oh, sorry, I, I, I miswrote this uh, statement, but it may be counter to what's intended. So that's something to consider. But nonetheless, um, the conservation corridor does speak to the environmental preservation concerns that residents expressed last year. So is that something that you are in favor of is including location within a conservation corridor? To be a characteristic of RS1 lots. Mr. Ramler Olson, would this follow the same logic <clears throat> where a neighborhood, let's just say they're on the edge of this conservation corridor and uh, the final two properties are not uh, technically in the conservation corridor? Would this have an allowance where they could be grouped with their neighboring lots? Or is this a hard? line of you have to be in the conservation corridor to be eligible for RS1? Uh, Chair, the the lines are a little, I, I believe, a little fuzzy. Uh, they could be, it wouldn't uh, preclude um, lots that were just outside. As long, again, if um, as far as staff is concerned, this is ultimately a city decision, but staff would not consider that disqualifying for considering uh, uh, to uh, a rezoning. All right. Thank you. Thoughts? Commissioner Curry. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think it's probably unnecessary to add this, uh, that it's so subjective uh, that it might actually like weaken the definition of RS1. <laughs> so I don't think it's needed. Okay. Sure, Goldsman. I agree. It's not needed. I was kind of 50 50 on it. Commissioner Albrecht? That's how I feel too. Clarifying 50 50. 50 50. Okay. Okay. Quick question for me. Uh, please, Commissioner Goldsman. Are all of the current RS1 lots in the conservation corridor? Uh, Chair, uh, Commissioner, no, not all the RS1 lots are within the conservation corridor. Um, uh, don't know if I have a map. That's that's okay. You, no, um, it's, it's fine. If uh, I'm operating from memory, but I believe it's Timberglade and those uh, the two lots along Normandale Boulevard yeah. are outside the conservation corridor. Right. Thank you. Moving on. Um, oh, well, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you can see right here where, where it is. Uh, oh, that I should, should also have included Greenbrier. I forgot I included this uh, egg on my face. Anyways, uh, yes, so this is the, the boundary of the conservation corridor. And these red outlines are showing uh, the current RS1 areas and where they are with respect to that corridor. And they do, does show that um, I mean, uh, uh, the Forest Haven area is entirely within the, the conservation corridor. Actually, that's the only one that's entirely within the, the conservation corridors. So um, that's for your consideration. Again, just comparing those two different uh, minimum lot areas and how they, uh, sorry, how they stack up uh, with respect to the their location within the conservation or their location with respect to the conservation corridor. So, Mr. Rambler Olson. Uh, perhaps this was covered in our last item, and you might not have the answer. And if you don't, that's okay. Can you remind me how these uh, conservation corridors are established? Is it by some 
body. Uh, Chair, yeah, uh, the uh, Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Uh, With your background uh, on these, do you suspect they could change over time, or are they, is this something that's been in place since, you know, legacy? Chair, I'm going to... Yeah, I, I, I'm una unable to say. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if uh, my colleagues in attendance have any more information than I do on that, how often they are updated. But um, uh, I do know that it starts out with the DNR and then it, um, it goes to other, uh, other review bodies that um, kind of refine the, the boundaries, uh, just with more local knowledge. And that's fed back into the shape of these uh, conservation corridors. I think that's that's good enough for me. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, moving on. So, staff also looked. I mean, when we're doing these reviews of districts, it's it's a good opportunity to also review the uh, the uses that are allowed within the district. You know, either they're permitted or conditional or some other form of allowance. But nonetheless, uh, staff did examine the use table for the RS1 district. Um, and we are proposing two additions to the district. We're um, proposing that two family dwellings and groupings of two family dwellings be uh, allowed within the RS1 district. Um, some reasoning behind that is that it does advance the city's goal to add more housing and it could encourage uh, more housing diversity. I mean, I understand that the, um, the probability of, of that of that occurring uh, is low, but nonetheless, it does offer that option. So um, maybe no harm, nonetheless, if uh, if it's already if it would be allowed, um, it would bring the RS1 district into regulatory alignment with the R1 district, considering that we allow two family uh, dwellings in both districts, and we also we currently allow groupings of two family dwellings within R within R1. So. Uh, again, creating that alignment between between the two. Um, RS1 lots are guided low density residential in our comprehensive plan, and two family dwellings are compatible with low density low density residential areas. So it would also be um, in compliance, or it would be compatible with what our land use guidance currently tells us. And it's not necessarily inconsistent with RS1. The um, uh, two family dwellings aren't inconsistent with RS1. Uh, you can design two family two uh, family dwellings uh, to be respectful of the environment and uh, to protect natural resources. So um, we didn't see that conflict there. And so uh, two families seemed like a, a good fit for the RS1 district. And we're also proposing the removal of a, of a few uses. Um, these are all institutionally related. Um, the, the RS1, when it was conceived, was not uh, conceived as in, as a district to house um, institutional uses like schools and, and whatnot that, that are defined institutional. So um, we are removing these. It's just a discrepancy that we found within the use table. So it's, it's really bringing the, the uses in spirit with the RS1 district as it was originally conceived. Um, so I'm sorry, maybe I should stop there. Are there any questions or discussions uh, about uses, um, what, what we're proposing? I suppose I should have had that prompt on this slide, but I apologize. So if there's any, if you have any thoughts about that, please let me know. Okay, Mr. Marker Group. Yes, <clears throat> Chair Cookton, one um, thing to think about with two family dwellings, we often th think of them as new construction, but they could easily be conversions as well. Imagine a large lot uh, gets converted from single family to two family without any, you know, changes on the ground, but all internal uh, retrofit. So something to consider there. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rammer Olson, I previously have not been familiar with the idea of groupings of two family dwellings. Can you just help me understand what that means? Um, uh, Chair, yes. I... I the way it's um, uh, uh, that staff understands or that uh, has staff has conceived it is just um, I mean, I think it's it's pretty explicit in the in the phrase itself this grouping of two family dwellings. So uh, assemblage of two family dwellings on one lot. Um, 
I don't, uh, th those standards, I'm sorry, that use is a conditional use already within R1 we, um, because of the increased impacts to the, uh, the, the, the surrounding area. So it is held uh, as a conditional use and conditions are applied to that use that if it were to be implemented in R1 and that same consideration would be brought to RS1, knowing that if you had a grouping of two family dwellings, again, an assemblage all on one lot, that'd be multiple dwelling or uh, multiple units, but grouped by two, we knew, we know that the impacts would be uh, greater than otherwise. And so we would still consider that, or we'd still, uh, we we're proposing that to be a conditional use within RS1. Um, Plan, you might have to provide some more clarity on uh, the groupings of two, uh, two family dwellings. So putting it simply, it's two duplexes. Uh, Chair, yes. Uh, Mr. Johnson? Yeah, Chair Crookton, uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, just to provide a little clarity on that one um, and recognizing the late hour, I'll try and be uh, succinct, but uh, the the way it was set up originally is that a grouping is constituted when there's more than one two-family dwelling within 500 feet as measured along uh, block faces. And uh, that previously was uh, only allowed through the approval of a plan development. And as part of the single and two-family uh, zoning updates last May, uh, that was changed to a conditional use, uh, be, uh, um, able to be approved by the Planning Commission subject to an appeal. So it lowered the uh, approval process to get that. But it's not two two-family dwellings on one lot. Um, it is, uh, they have to be on separate and distinct lots, but they're within 500 feet of each other as measured along a block face. Mm -hmm. So just to okay, clarify so on that one. You can't separate. have two duplexes on one lot. That'd can't. be a townhome development. Yeah, effectively. great. Okay, to thank you. For, a different zoning district. Thank you for that clarification. Thoughts? Okay. Commissioner Curry? Um, I mean, I, again, I don't think, honestly, I just don't think you're going to see duplex developments done in RS1 lots because of the cost of the lot. So while... Well, I would, I guess we can, I could support the update. I just don't see it happening at 33,000 square feet. Commissioner Goldsman. I agree with new development. However, you know, I think um, planning manager Margaret Gard made a good point. Um, these homes can be relatively large in um, square footage and having a mother-in-law apartment, for lack of a better term, or uh, an ADU uh, for multi-generational families, that would, by opening up two family group or two family, that would allow for that to happen. Um, I'm, I would be in support of allowing them to have additional housing within the structure that exists today. Yeah, I'm supportive of it too. Again, when I drove through this, this afternoon, I, I found it to be fairly dense and I didn't think having and these are some pretty darn large houses in a lot of cases, and a duplex is going to be the same size as that. And, you know, perhaps there's some stereotypes in your mind of what a duplex looks like. But in this, if you're talking about these neighborhoods, if somebody is really going to go build a duplex, it's going to be a dang nice one. It's going to have nice finishes. It's going to be a high-quality thing, and it's going to be the same size as one of these giant houses. It's just going to have two doors. And so I'm fine with allowing duplexes. Any further thoughts? Seeing none. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, one, um, one additional okay. thought, Commissioner Goldsman. So I was actually moving on to the second bullet point. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I am in support of removing those bullet points because they don't make any sense for RS1. I agree with that. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Goldsman. Okay, uh, thank you, Chair. I will move on. Uh, the next uh, characteristic or the next uh, subject to uh, discuss is the use of prevailing setbacks within uh, the RS1 district. It applies to all new single family and two family dwellings um, within R1A. And um, I mean, currently RS1 doesn't allow two family dwellings. Um, uh, the prevailing setback standard 
basically means that structures must meet an increased setback um, along a street if a new dwelling uh, directly abuts uh, one or more single family dwellings that were in existence prior to, or in existence on 19, uh, October 7th, 1974. I'm not sure what informed that date. Uh, sorry about that if I don't have that information readily available. But um, essentially, the average minimum setback of each single family dwelling on a directly abutting site um, along the same street segment and with the same block base. That's what the uh, prevailing setback uh, applies to. Here's a illustration of how that's determined. So you can see how, um, again, the, the lot in the middle, is, the setback is influenced by the uh, lots to, um, to either side or to both sides of it. So it needs to consider that when it's, um, well, in this case, it's an addition. So where, where that front setback is, the, the prevailing setback that is. Um, some observations about the prevailing setback that staff would like to note and, and bring up at, uh, before discussing its inclusion is just to note that it does impose costs on the property owner and it could have negative impacts on the lot's environmental quality. It um, That's usually in the form of a longer driveway. So if a home is set further back, um, they're going to have to, they're going to have to have a longer driveway than otherwise. And that's an increased cost for that homeowner or that property owner. And um, that's more impervious surface that they're putting on the, on the lot itself. So they're just serving the ground by uh, installing a longer, longer driveway. And then, uh, and then that comes with uh, actual financial costs to the property owner and more financial costs with uh, in, uh, the surveying that needs to be done to get the, the setbacks of abutting lots, something to consider. And again, um, similar to median site width, it just increases the regular regulatory complexity of the RS1 district. And so that's something to consider if it's actually a worthwhile uh, standard to, to maintain. So um, I'll leave that up to you if, if it's something that should be maintained. Discussion? Commissioner Curry? I think you leave it. Uh, I think removing the setback just provides opportunity to just fully develop, I think, more of, you know, more of a large property and just tear down a bunch of trees in these neighborhoods. I, too, am in favor of leaving it. I don't have a problem with the current setup. Commissioner Goldsman? So I think about the last five and a half years that I've been on the commission, and this topic has come up twice, maybe. Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I can't remember if they were in the RS1 district. I think one of them was. Um, but I'm I'm in favor of just leaving it. Commissioner Albrecht. Uh, thank you, Chair. Also <clears throat> agree about leaving it. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Chair. I'll move on. So uh, we are talking about a, a zoning district, and there, and we are responding to some residents' interest in. Uh, rezoning their property or uh, their neighborhood to RS1. And so uh, that's what prompted this, this study of RS1. But um, as far as staff is concerned, we are not recommending any wild sca uh, wide scale proactive city initiated rezonings through this effort. We are just, we are proposing some, uh, we're looking at, we're providing analysis of what currently exists in and recommending or uh, providing some optional changes to it, but um, we're not recommending any rezonings. Uh, those rezonings can occur uh, privately or publicly initiated, so um, that's always an option outside of this uh, outside of this project. Um, however, when we uh, do uh, when we do have applications before us to uh, consider rezoning, we are recommending five criteria that has to be satisfied. Um, when evaluating those requests, um, uh, the number one would be the consistency with the RS1 intent. Is the lot or the lots being considered for rezoning? Are they, do they, uh, do they fall in line with uh, the criteria within the intent that we've been discussing tonight? Um, 
Is there, um, you know, what's the appropriate level of conforming with the RS1 standards? Are they meeting the RS1 standards as they are? So that's something that ought to be considered and can be evaluated by the city. Um, the scale of the rezoning action, uh, the number of lots, um, how many, uh, how many lots um, are within a contiguous group? Does it make sense? And again, this would be based on uh, the city's inter or uh, uh, the the city's consideration. Uh, staff would obviously have a recommendation, but the the group of lots that are being considered for rezoning should be substantial and uh, be contiguous in order to form a, a cohesive uh, area of the district. Um, neighborhood continuity, again, that kind of speaks to point number three. And the proportion of neighborhood support, um, that proportion is again up for the city's up to the city's discretion. If it should just be a simple majority, something that exceeds 50%, or if there's another threshold that ought to be met. But um, that's you know, those specifics can be determined by the city, but we want to put forth those criteria when we're assessing rezoning requests. So um uh do you uh, does the planning commission have any thoughts or any any sort of considerations of those uh, that criteria? Uh, forgive me, Mr. Ram, or also maybe it's because it's getting late. But could you clarify what you're looking for from us on this slide? Uh, certainly, Chair. Yeah. Uh, so those five uh, different criteria that I, I mentioned um, are you is there. Are you are you fine with uh, it having? Are you are you fine with actually imposing those criteria when we're assessing rezoning requests? Are you fine with the criteria as they are, or would you recommend any any amendments to what we've drafted, or is this something that we should carry forward to the city council? Thank you. Thoughts, Commissioner Curry. Uh, I'm on board with everything on this page. Okay, Commissioner Goldsman. I guess the question that I have is based on the converse, based on what we've discussed so far. Are there any properties, or how many properties could actually petition to be RS one based on the things that we've put out there? Is that even an opportunity for any properties? And if it is, then I'm I'm in support of this, um, but I don't know how feasible it will be based on the parameters that we've set. I'm having uh, difficulty forming any uh, worthwhile thoughts for this one. Commissioner <laughs> Albrecht. Uh, I agree. I'm having a hard time. Uh, to me, uh, forgive me. To me, what we've said already is more important to me yes. than what any what any type of bow we can put on top of this thing. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll move on. Uh, you know, some just some some uh, housekeeping items. You know, we are engaging, or we do have means to engage folks. Uh, we've uh, set up a Let's Talk Bloomington page where we host information about the project, and it provides a medium uh, by which people can submit comments or questions to staff. We've already received a few comments. Um, I emailed uh, those out earlier today. Um, some in support, some uh, or not necessarily support. I mean, there's no firm recommendations, but there are some that would like to maintain RS1 as is, and then there's some that are interested in some of these changes uh, as it may afford them subdividing opportunities. Uh, so there's a. It's only a few, so I mean, it's not a. It's not a broad swath of uh, feedback we've received, but nonetheless, we have this available. And just to let you know, we have uh, a study session scheduled to the council on February 12th, and that um, we're foreseeing um, public hearings sometime during April to uh, to uh, consider any uh, amendments to the RS1 district, if there are any that are considered worthwhile pursuing. And that's the end of the presentation. Questions for staff? Seeing none, Mr. Rambler Olson, I want to reiterate, we appreciate your work on this. I thought the staff report was comprehensive and well done. Your presentation matched. Um, if we were a bit uh, surly, it's only because it's after 11 o'clock. So thank you for your efforts on this.
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, members of the Planning Commission. Have a good night. Good night. We'll move then to item number five. Uh, Mr. Mark Regard with the Planning Commission Policies and Issue Update. Yeah. Chair and Commissioners, our next meeting is February 15th in two weeks. Just two items on the agenda. We have a public hearing uh, amendments to the Opportunity Housing Ordinance, uh, which you talked about uh, recently in study session. And then a study item on speed limits, specifically on larger roadways. Um, and then March 7th, only one item on the agenda so far, which is a public hearing on a privately initiated city code amendment uh, to add congregate living facilities as an interim use in the I-2 uh, zoning district. That's what we have coming up. Okay. Thank you for that. This is an opportunity for us to have any planning commissioners bring up anything that was not on this evening's agenda. I think I will make one comment. And um, we had three pretty comprehensive study items tonight. And I, I don't mind having long meetings. Um, I prefer that, though, to be reserved for when we have applicants before us. If, if we got six people that want to put up apartment buildings and we're here till 11, I am fine with that. I think there might have been an opportunity to split up these study items more than we did. And I don't mean this to call out staff. I only bring it up in this forum because um, if any of my fellow commissioners have comments, this is an opportunity to say it because we can't talk about this as the four of us because of open meeting law anywhere else. So uh, that's just my opinion. I, I would like to see perhaps a, a little more discretion with some of these more comprehensive study items only because I don't want us to lose focus because it's getting late and we we don't give proper focus to the last one because it was last. So, Commissioner Curry? Yeah, I would agree with that, I think. Sign sign ordinance takes a lot of time, so maybe that wasn't accounted for up front, but that would be helpful going forward. Okay. Um, with that, I would just like to say thanks to city staff for sticking around tonight. It's been um, a late one. I also want to acknowledge Londell Pease, who is uh, ending his career with the city of Bloomington. Uh, from all my understandings, he's been a, a, a real um, – asset to this community for a long time and we appreciate his service so a hearty planning commission uh farewell to londell pease uh, as he departs the city of bloomington and um, a special thanks to grant back in the control room for sticking with us uh, kind of an unsung hero of the planning commission uh doing all the tv work for us uh late at night so thanks grant um anything else with that we will adjourn good night mm -hmm.